Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smashbox TV's podcast 478. Gonna scoot away from me a little bit there. That's what you're gonna do. The first thing you, you open the show. You could have done it before the show, but you wait for the show to open, then you look over and you scoot away a little bit. That's what I do. Just well, to score I, up. I'm here with Johnny V. So glad to be here. Happy Halloween, everybody. Happy Halloween. It's October 31st, 2023. I'm sure we've done a broadcast on Halloween before. I'm sure we have. If we went back and checked some of the math, uh, I would assume that we've been here. We've done them on New Year's. I know that we've done them on birthdays. Yeah. So I don't recall a Halloween, but I, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure we've done one. I know that <laughs> I did make a post that came up from eight years ago when I was at the Halloween Classic in Las Vegas, which I'll touch on more in a moment. But I was at the one in 2015. And the post that popped up on Facebook was that we were at the Paris Hotel, and not I was just you me. were not that yeah. I was there along with some of the crew from Legacy, and that, that was sounds um, like a lot of trouble to me. <laughs> that was I'm not gonna lie. Terry. That was one of my first evenings of ever um, partaking or enjoying or being um, privy to uh, experiencing bottle service at a <laughs> at any form of establishment because I, I ain't fancy like that normally. I don't believe I've ever had that experience. So, uh, and if you're gonna do it. Halloween in Vegas is the right place, one of the right places to be doing it at. So uh, a, a very fun and fond memory, of course, nothing but fun and wholesome times had there. So big shout out to my friends over there at Legacy, uh, one of the many, many moments throughout the years that I'll forever remember. So um, yes, and then I will real quickly touch on since it's not going to get elaborated on tonight. I did have the pleasure of being in Las Vegas this weekend, which was somewhat almost under the radar only because I'm working on the footage, which is already the editing has already started, but I don't really want to talk the event or even the results. It was a, it was a phenomenal B tier with a lot of fun, but I am hoping that by this time, one week from today, everything will be out. Maybe we'll even have the champion on. Of course, if you want to spoil it, go for it. But uh, I, Normally, we talk about where I just was, but with no footage and, and it being maybe under the radar, let's just hold off a week, and we'll talk about it next week. That's that's currently my plan, and if it's not edited by then, well, then we'll talk about it anyway, but that's the plan is to give you all that. We've got other eight tiers and things we can discuss and stuff coming up um, for this upcoming weekend, one of which is uh, the NADGT Championships will be taking place down there in Texas. I know there's going to be a lot of excitement around there. Technically, that will be the last official live broadcast of the Disc Golf Network for 2023. Of course, we closed out the you know USDGC and then the Pro Tour Championship, and, and those are what most people are tuning in for and would come to expect. But there is one more, and it's taking place this weekend. So the NADGT uh, Championships in Texas, I believe the – I don't know if it's just the final nine or if it's 18 plus nine, something of that nature. Um, There's going to be the, the the final putts and the final shots will all be shown. Fairly sure. I would give this a good 88.43% look dumb. Look dumb. chance that we're going to see two 18s, one from MPO and one from FPO, of just the final four competitors. That that sounds roughly checks out what I think with what I think I, I heard at 1.2. So there, regardless, you're going to see the champions crowned uh, down there in Texas for the NADGT, and that will be the official final live Disc Golf Network broadcast of the year that I know of. Unless something else pops up that's crazy, but I highly doubt that. So, all right. So with that, uh, welcome in again, everyone. Tonight, we're going to have Seth Muncy join us. He is doing some trick-or-treating and Halloween obligations uh, along with his kids and family right now and uh, wrapping up his night. So we told him we'll take him whenever he pops onto the show. We'll be ready and we'll stop whatever mindless conversation we're currently having and then we will get to someone much smarter and that means Seth will join us and we'll talk to him about this season and then probably talk a little bit about off-season. So if you're already thinking about some things that either uh, – you want to put into your routine or some things to think about, maybe we can, you know, pick Seth's brain a little bit on that. The big news that dropped literally the day after the podcast, Wednesday, mm. um, I'm going to have to talk to someone at the Pro Tour about that. They were supposed to drop it on Tuesday. I, I remember hearing that, but it got delayed a day. I mean, I don't know quite why. A, what they're calling 
a unified European tour. Now, that might be a little confusing because we have the unified tour here. <laughs> yes. Um, but this is a joint European tour from what was the EPT, what was the Euro, the Euro tour, are mm -hmm. now technically merged, combined, gobbled up. I don't know how you want to phrase it. But uh, it was announced on Wednesday of last week that the EPT basically is going to join with the Disc Golf Pro Tour, and the Euro Tour next year will be non-existent. And instead, what we're going to get is we're going to get five Elite Series events, which will all be live broadcast, that are part of the Disc Golf Pro Tour as well. As well as an undetermined number of future Silver events. Now, these aren't events that Silver Lot is running. He's running? No. Damn, that'd be awesome if he did. He just reads, I am the Silver Series. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, no. But uh, ultimately, I'm sure he'll go to some of the Silver events. Uh, I mean... It would make sense. Yeah. But ultimately, we're going to see a unified tour next year. The gentleman at Disc Golf Stream, and specifically Yuha, who also ran the EPT, are now employees of the Disc Golf Pro Tour. Yuha is the European media director, I believe, is was his title. European media. He does something with European media. I don't know if he's technically a director, a VP manager, uh, I don't know, corporal, admiral, could be anything for all I know. But that is technically his tour. So he's going to kind of be heading up the European side of the the tour. Media-wise. Media-wise, out of DGPT Europe. I'm sure he's going to have a say in some of the events, probably helping with silver. Now, my understanding is that the silver events that show up, they will have post-production, but mm -hmm. we will not see live production from those. Okay. Only the Elite Series events will have live production. Okay. And the European Open, which is a major. But that's I, I, I kind of assume that's a given. If you're listening, you probably know that. If you, if you ask the question and we were in the same room, I'd probably slap you but, and say, don't be dumb. Don't be, don't be a dumb, dumb head. Don't be a dumb uh, his head. official title, uh, since I happen to pull it up in front of me, uh, he, he was the former EPT... Uh, da, 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 da. uh now dgpt europe media director okay and uh miko uh, uh wickman former tour director for the ept will serve as the dgpt europe operations manager so i see good things and bad things about this um and the good completely outweigh the bad which is great which is the way we want it now, the good thing is, if you're a viewer, one less subscription that you could have signed up for. Disc Golf Stream, you don't... I was... You and I both had subscriptions. I think you got yours comped. I'm not going to lie. I did not. I paid for mine, you, huh? Um, but I had a subscription to both. I would wake up in the morning, flip on the uh, Disc Golf Stream, watch a little bit there, wait till the afternoon, then we'd get a little bit more, or the FPO on our side, then the MPO... And we'd have, we'd have a lot of overlap. If you were a fan of disc golf, it, I mean, on one hand, it was really great. You had all the disc golf you could consume. On the other hand, that's a lot of disc golf that's overlapping. We have a unified tour. We don't have to worry about overlapping tour events in Europe. Yeah. The, I, and I'm assuming that the guys who moved from the EPT to the DGPT, they've got full-time jobs. Now, I know Yuha has always been kind of an entrepreneur over there, a disc golf entrepreneur specifically, I believe. And he created this media company. Now, the downside that I see, unfortunately, is less competition. Now, again, depending on who you want to ask, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. The Pro Tour clearly wants to be a one-stop shop for all things live disc golf. They, they do a phenomenal job. I wouldn't, I wouldn't contract with them if I didn't like and uh, commend what they were doing. But I do like competition. I like the fact that there was a, an EPT pushing the DGPT. Because to be honest, 
I don't think that the DGPT or DGN would have moved into the Euro Tour had it not been for the EPT. Now, the way I see it, and maybe I'm wrong, this is just an outsider's view, EPT shows up, does a pretty commendable job. Euro Tour sees, PDGA Europe sees what they probably look at as a competitor and something that they don't want to see happen to what happened here in the U.S., where we have two competing tours. So then what we see is the Euro Tour expand and get, you know, a pretty significant investment in it. We saw Paul Macbeth show up. They had uh, live, live broadcasting through DGN. And now we don't have that. So the, the Euro Tour is gone for now, or probably permanently if this works out. Now, my guess, Europe couldn't sustain two tours. That's my guess. You've got certain amount of income, certain amount of players, certain amount of sponsors that probably want to be associated with disc golf. That's a lot of different uh, mouths to feed right there. So there's a chance that the EPT was not profitable and that much like kind of the Jomez acquisition, this actually maybe saved the EPT sort of. I think the PDGA Euro Tour probably could have continued because they, with the PDGA backing, that's a pretty significant financial backing. But now we see one combined tour. So while, again, I, I feel like the EPT helped push the DGPT into Europe, maybe a little sooner than they wanted. Ultimately, the DGPT gets what they want and now are and working with Yuha from the EPT, one combined tour that they will work on, hopefully expanding the European tour, because ultimately they're going to get, in theory, less big events. Because at that, I think last year we had like 13 or 14 quote unquote tour events between the two tours. This year we're getting five elite series and some silver events. And I don't know, those could be really big silver events. Nothing's yeah. been announced yet. I, I'm not going to make any uh, assumptions on the whether that it's going to be sustainable for European only players. I don't know that. And we won't know until we, until we see the silver events. Yeah. And I guess the follow up to that is if, if they, ha if we have five events that are elite events and then there's eight to 10 silver events and that matches roughly the 13 that we saw last year, it, yeah. it may feel the same. still very similar it might yeah it, with a few of those events just being additionally elevated so i don't know that it necessarily indicates any anything negative in that sense it's just a matter of you you're looking at a different naming structure some slightly different points allocated and things of that nature i guess the the bigger question that has to be asked is do we see a world where there is a tour that or a portion of the tour that is 10 elite series events ever over there or will it always be that they're going to be playing catch up or second fiddle to what's happening in in the states and whether that's due to money or location and, or resources and yeah and that's a great question because this is a problem that the dgbt now has to solve in that you have an expanding in theory hopefully european tour so you have ultimately what again what i would love to see would be a, a U.S. tour and a Euro tour. And that, you know, whether the funds that go into both of them are the same or not, I guess it depends on how the Disc Golf Pro Tour wants to look at it, how the sponsors want to look at it. That's going to be very difficult. But we see that the tour finale here in the U.S. is the largest paying event of the year. I would love to see a semi-equivalent tour finale over in Europe as well with a lot of money. Now, the question is, are we going to see that? I don't know. Is the pro tour pushing for Europeans to come over in spring, jump back in, get their five to six events in, and then come back over here for, we'll say, worlds to uh, the pro tour finale most years? I know next year is going to be a little unique with the, with the uh, Champions Cup, but like, what is their goal? And I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't even know if the Pro Tour quite knows the answer to that yet. I believe the long-term 
outlook will probably be sustainability for two tours and that a, a, a US, someone in the US can go over there. Now, my guess is that it's probably never going to be quite as big as the US tour, just based on the number of players and the quality of players right now that the US has. It seems like we have, you know, the, you know, they've got, I would say, a handful of elite players on the MPO side and Kristen Tatar, Silva Saarinen, Evelina, and Henna. But ultimately, if you look at the, the number of elite players, the U.S. has them beat. Yeah, and 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 again, that might change in ten years with the way that. With the way that continent is uh, well, is pumping out kids. Yeah, if it continues to be a logical tour that has the financial backing and resources and you're playing great courses and the payouts continue to increase, then it makes perfect sense. And it might be a lot of people really like the Euro stops because of the courses. Those, yeah. those courses are a different style than the U.S. courses. We see a lot of people here in the U S complain about the early tour stops, the, the openness, the flatness of them. You could probably go over to Europe, depending on how these silver events are, and they might not be as valuable, but you could probably get some really cool wooded courses in if you really wanted to, and maybe even be able to sustain a living over there. Now it's going to be more difficult for a U.S. person to go over there because you have to upend your life. A lot of our touring players here are obviously van life people. Yeah. So that's going to be more difficult, but. I mean, the Euro style courses are real popular. So maybe, maybe we're going to hope, maybe there'll be some uh, push for that. Yeah. I, I think that becomes the ultimate question is what is the long term goal for the golf that's played over there in terms of what is televised and, um, how long we we want to be there, so to speak, and then just like here in the U.S., if if you have a bunch of events on great courses that maybe aren't getting the love of the pro tour, mm -hmm. it won't be long before they say, "Hey, we're going to create a tour of our own." I mean, and I know that was kind of a a quiet sentiment underneath so, this year's scheduling from the pro tour, sure. which is, hey, we're losing a ton of great silver events. There's a bunch of uh, events that are are elite series quality, quality, but aren't getting that distinction or weren't selected or, or picked to be this year. And, and so yeah, funding as well. I mean, you uh, yeah, have... of course. Yeah. And yeah, and have funding and have yeah. these types of things and, and have it all. Of course, the, the main component that one of the main components they're missing out on would be the live media coverage. Uh, but Very it continues to, replicate, to it continues to talk about a sale. lot of different uh, opportunities that could be um, that could become available, and if if there's enough driven people with a lot of great courses and good events, yeah. it just might push somebody. Or look at what Cali has done in a with similar sense with the Masters Tour, you know, trying to scratch that itch, so to speak. So anything is possible for what's going to happen. I mean. As we know, you can only hold hold down or ignore or hold back or or not select, uh, you know, passionate, dedicated, uh, well run events for so long before then either they uh, entirely give up and go away or they band together with a or bond together with a few other events. Both terms and, would work. Yeah, exactly. And then they ultimately go on to uh, create something special of their own, and it may or may not, you know, rise to a the, you know the. I'd love to see it. The size of other stuff. To be honest, right? I think it would be fun. Again, com competition drives um, excellence to have a secondary tour. The hard part is getting pros away from. Certainly. The, because as we know, the, the pro tour finale is a big pull because of the money. You want to qualify for that. So getting pros to. I mean, if Casey Wide Open showed up and had a you know a hundred thousand dollar purse, which honestly I could see, sure, that's one of the you know one of the events I think that you know could could really pull that off. They've got the quality of courses there. The question is, would you be able to pull in? You're probably not pulling in your your very top guys, the ones that maybe don't. Well, I guess that's or tough to say. The guys that want a weekend off. 
the guys don't. I mean, who says it there's has only to be so a, many weekends in the year too? Who, who says it has to be a weekend off? If you if if let's just say KC Wide Open is going up against uh, OTB. I was going to say, okay, go on. Just uh, anyone, Portland, OTB, Beaver State, whatever that is. And the quality of the, what the players maybe deem the quality of the course, maybe they like better, mm -hmm. the style. If the money is at least the same, the players that maybe have already guaranteed themselves a spot into the tour finale, I could see them maybe just going to play this really big, awesome, we'll say A tier or second tour event mm -hmm. without... I don't know. I would love to see it just for competition. Well, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what what continues to drive. And, and, you know, you can rewind here on Smashbox five or six or eight years and and Please see don't. how it's evolved in that what used to get players to events versus what it is today. And then just how much the overall landscape of tour events, what that looks like. And it, it, they're just two totally different worlds. It, I mean, many years ago, like money, money. If you had a good guaranteed purse, money would get any player to just about anywhere. Yeah. Almost any weekend, in any occasion, a little, whether that was paying for the entry fee and or saying first place is five grand or three grand or whatever it was, uh, you know, putting you up, whatever. There were so many now what feel like very basic things it used to be enough to entice a player or bribe or, or persuade a player or a set of players to play in events and now there's so much more money infused in our sport that it's not just exclusively the payout there's there's 20 other factors of which the disc golf pro tour has been trying to hone in on those other 20 factors and that's why it does make it so much more of a stranglehold that they have versus another upcoming event that doesn't have that same prestige that comes along and says, hey, we're trying to check all these boxes. We're trying to have all these factors here for you. And that still just may or may not be enough. It's it, only time's going to tell. Um, and if people even wanted to, that's a tall task. Like if we're being real, like that's a really tall task to say, hey, I'd like to go compete with a Disc Golf Pro Tour event on the same weekend. Mm -hmm. And here's all the boxes we can check. There's still going to be a couple they're going to come up short on no matter what they do probably. But here's some of the boxes we're, we're promising to check. And does anybody even want to kind of take on that that much of a task or a risk? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing somebody will at if, some point. If the sport continues to grow but, and expand and the money is there from sponsors that either don't want to, for whatever reason, don't want to advertise with the Pro Tour or are just looking for alternate, maybe you're, maybe you're uh, – looking for more local uh sure representation and graphic representation. Yeah, yeah sure i i don't yeah i don't see why it couldn't happen but yeah or or somebody that just really the last point i'll make on that is the other possibility not only just a new a uh, person that enters the market that possibly comes in with a lot of money or somebody that just says hey we intentionally do not support uh, we'll just say the pro tour and our company is going to face, uh, is going to invest in really being the major backbone to an entirely alternative tour. And I guess the best example I have of that is we had a prodigy tour in Europe last year or prodigy was the, prodigy you know, was one of the big backers was one of the, the big APT. sponsors. So if someone like a prodigy or prodigy I'm just going to throw out a lone star, uh, because we've, we often hear of the money that's infused there. If Lone Star tomorrow came out and said, guess what? We're going to create a Lone Star tour, and it's going to have 10 phenomenal events with all of these insane payouts on all these really good courses with all these great established TDs, and we're going to have all this money, and we're going to have some media coverage that's not quite that's definitely not to the level in which the pro tour has worked mm -hmm. itself into over the last eight years, but we're going to have definitely some media coverage and we're going to, again, check all these boxes. Yeah. It could look really appealing, well, but and will the, that be enough? Will, who, who will that sway? I think is the question. That's a great question. Um, to extrapolate that, imagine someone like to advertise on the pro tour is expensive. They have a lot of cheaper options, but there are less and less spots for advertising, so the money is going up. If you want to advertise, what probably could have got you, you know, five hundred bucks 
five years ago is probably closer to 5,000 bucks this year because there's only so many spots to advertise. Sure. So if you're looking at this and saying, well, gosh, if I want to advertise with the pro tour all year, let's say it's 50,000, it's 10,000, whatever, maybe that money is better spent in pushing out a brand new tour. Like, ah, it's 50,000, I might get my name on every event. No. Something, something along those lines could be one of the reasons why this spawns. Yeah. It, it, uh, I guess all we can do is wait and see, uh, as to if somebody wants to take on that task and, and maybe you, Terry. you're at home listening. <laughs> nope. Not me. Not me uh, but you're at home listening and, uh, and you know, the right people who want to get involved and, and the opportunity just might present itself and, uh, it's going to take a ton of work because we're not trying to undersell all the efforts that have already been, uh, the lessons that have been learned, the hardships, the trials, the, uh, the the sixty plus person uh, team that is the pro tour plus contractors like there's the, there's a reason it's uh <laughs> it is what it is today it's it's taken quite a bit to get this far all right well let's talk a little bit about what we did see otherwise we saw that announcement which spawned that conversation but now we uh, we saw some golf uh, go down so let's uh, let's read off a few a tiers that went down this weekend it's the spooky season and the hub city <laughs> halloween open a lot of halloween based events this weekend Terry. weird and coming up this upcoming weekend i think there's going to be a few of them yet shocker um we saw in spartanburg i'm sorry yeah spartanburg south carolina ezra robinson Beats Andrew Marweed by a single stroke, taking home $1,700. Third place was Jake Mon, tied with AJ Carey. Fifth place, Jake Wolf. That's your top five right there. A lot of well established known names still playing. Playing golf. I mean, some of these guys don't have the benefit of being able to just take the offseason off so that they're, they're going to continue to play these uh, regional A tiers and hopefully pull in. Between a thousand and two thousand dollars every, you know, a month or every couple of weeks if they're lucky. So, as a Robinson takes this one over in, there was no FPO division. Uh, in MP40, Barry Schultz runs this one down uh, with a five over par, beating Aaron Cunningham by nine strokes. And just for reference, Barry's round ratings: ten sixteen, ten twenty three, and then he cruised in at a nine eighty five. So. Congratulations to Mr. Barry Schultz and Ezra Robinson on your victories. Uh, we're going to talk about the Ontario Proven Provincial Disc Golf Championships. Didn't spit that one out to save my life. Um, Canada's own Thomas Gilbert wins this. Uh, he put a he put a beat down over Chris Brown, which is funny if you think about it. Chris Brown. <laughs> too <laughs> soon. Too soon. Uh, is it too, too soon? soon? No. <laughs> I think we're just at enough time. 16 strokes. Thomas Gilbert slaps Chris Brown around. FPO division, Chantel Budzinski uh, wins this over Chloe Winter. Congratulations to Chantel. Miss Frisbee. Miss Frisbee's doing work. You got it. 275, she wins in that one. So that okay. is your Ontario. U.S. dollars, that is. Those aren't Canadian Correct. dollars. Eh? It says prize, U.S. I know. I yes. know. That's what I'm yes. saying, U.S. dollars. They're, they didn't get them in, what, <laughs> to Toonsies or whatever they're, whatever I, they're called? I, I think they're just called Canadian dollars, aren't they? I think their coins are like, oh, like their pennies or something else. No, I forget exactly oh. which. But uh, is it Toonsies? No, it's something like it's something just like that, though. Okay, but that's <laughs> now I'm gonna look. All right, go ahead and look. What what am I googling? Uh, Canadian, Canadian coins. Coins. Yeah. What are the Canadian coins names? Yeah. Uh, five cents is a nickel. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> Ten cents is a dime. Twenty-five cents is a quarter. Uh, a loony. A loony, not a toony. Thank you. A loony, <laughs> loony is... toony. No, the, a there's loony... there's a loony and a toony. Yeah, a loony is a dollar. A toony is two dollars. <laughs> okay, right? I guess. So I knew it was something like I, that. It's I, a coin. It's not a dollar. It's not their current. Well, it is currency. It's not their paper <laughs> currency. <laughs> Maybe it is, but I think it's a coin. I think it's an actual like two dollar coin they have. So I'm. I wasn't. No, very far off. You weren't being a Looney Tooney, that's for sure. Being, uh, <laughs> uh, so, congratulations to me. I need to get to Canada still, and I, that, a, I'd be more educated on their uh, currencies, on, on their but I, just in general, I need to get to Canada. That's that's for another day. Like you're running away to Canada, like um, like you've got a like you've got a girlfriend in Canada, and no. nobody's met her. Like no, really, guys, no, She's, not yet. She but Canada. it would be <laughs> no. Uh, so. I just need to get there. I know you do. 
Uh, the only other A tier this weekend, and I'm, I kind of avoided it, but I guess I'll try to spit it out here because I'm going to massacre this, is the EPT All-Star. So the final EPT event, not of this season, but maybe of history, was over in Spain. Winning first place was Pekka Hyvenen. Going with that one. Who Give wins me an A three, for effort. 3,162 US dollars. In second place, Yelte Jensen. In third place, Nestori Dukanen. Dukanen? Sure. And in fourth place, <laughs> Isaac Robinson. <laughs> Isaac Robinson, who went over there. <laughs> Isaac, why couldn't you just win? That would have been, that would have been, I would have stopped at one then, Isaac. I just would have stopped at one. Um, Isaac Robinson tied with uh, Jakob Samarad in fourth place. Oh, as well as Silver Lock. So those were, three were tied for fourth. I did see Isaac and Alden, Alden uh, fly over there. Alden, unfortunately, missed cash while over there. So. Yeah, we talked about that last week, and I did not put two and two together, and I don't think you did either at the time. We talked last week about how no, we I saw put, them. I put Toonie and Toonie together. Yeah, Toonie and Toonie. <laughs> we saw them go over there, and uh, we were uncertain as to the reasoning. And then, uh, like, two days later, it was quite obvious when you well, saw scores for this. I didn't realize they were going over to play in this event. I figured they were going over to play an event. I didn't realize I did it would be the all-star event because that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Considering I think they only played a handful of European events while they were over there. Maybe two, three. But either way. No reason not to get them in there, especially when, you know, you got Alden Harris who's just donating cash over there. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. Uh, in the FPO division, Ouch. Yenny Karten, uh, $937, beating Marie Kailas by a single stroke. Congratulations. In third place, Rachel Turton at plus five, winning $443. Those are your all-stars, your EPT all-stars. Yeah, some pretty solid payout for the size of the field. And I don't know how they arrived at those payouts in terms of, you know, if money was generated and then was the reserved. Season, maybe, and yeah, and then put together in this purse. But when you look at a 43 person total uh, attendance, and that's with FPO and MPO, and then you still saw three grand uh, given out for first place. Well, they could, empty, they could empty the coffers. They didn't need to save anything for next year. I, I guess not. So, uh, Nonetheless, uh, certainly of note, though, some pretty solid compensation that was handed out over there. And is that everything we saw for eight those tiers were, those in, were all in the of U.S.? Those eight tiers, in the, okay. not only in the U.S., Terry, in the world. Oh, that's true. That's a good point. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, I did see it was linked to me, and I, I'm not, I'll am not. i admit I'm not personally all too familiar with the channel, but it was linked to me. I know that Hub City did have some coverage, and it looks like, because, again, the link was sent to me, the YouTube channel is called Great Courses of South Carolina is the YouTube channel in which where some post-production has been put together. Uh, I, I don't know much else about it other than the fact that it's out there. It does exist. They have round one front nine was sent to me. I'm guessing there's going to be even more. And uh, I would assume all, all eight videos if there was, or I'm sorry, six videos, uh, four rounds. Wow. Three rounds, two videos per round would probably equal six. So that makes a lot of sense. Uh, go real, check it out real quick. We will talk. Just briefly about uh, a B tier that's happening at Bedford, Virginia. So maybe a little preview, very much so, of yeah. our world's courses. The Blue Chip Technologies Battle for Bedford, presented by Destination Bedford. Now, I normally am not a fan of these long names, but I didn't hear a single disc manufacturer in there, which mm. makes me happy that we have Blue Chip Technologies by Destination Bedford. Destination Bedford is probably their visitors mm. bureau. Probably. But, but blue and Blue Chip. Chip go ahead. Go, no, no, please. I was just going to say, in Blue Chip, uh, I apologize. I've spoken to him a couple of times uh, over maybe in two different places, um, the gentleman from Blue Chip and just massively supportive. I know they have sponsored a number of events in the area. And so uh, awesome to see and obviously a, a sizable payout and turnout that came this weekend. So thank you uh, to the guys over there at Blue Chip as well. And we do have some big names here. Um, Winning this one pretty handily, seven strokes. Chris Dickerson shooting a 1042, 1043, and then a 1035. So right around his rating, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, second place, Matt Hammerston win, or wins. Takes second place by seven strokes behind Chris Dickerson. Third place, Brody Smith shooting a two under. So three strokes behind Matt Hammerston. And he won 
$566. And the finally a tie for fourth between Carson Ham and Ian Burchett. So congratulations. Uh, going down, down. There's a lot of players here. Yeah, Holy 70, moly. almost 80 MPO competitors. Yeah, I see a couple of big names near the bottom there. In fact, uh, 78, 79, 80, 81. 81 MPO competitors, a few DNF. But when it was all said and done, 81 MPOs. Uh, winning and an FPO. A, winning an FPO, Debbie U, shooting a 12 over par. Round ratings 937, 967, 923. Not bad. All well above her average. Yeah, well above her, her 901 rating. rating. That's that's right around a probably usually probably the cash line for FPO at a pro tour event is my guess. So, you know, not not too bad. Uh, second place, Holly Finley, two strokes behind Debbie, and in third place, Irina Shekova at 29 over par. So, congratulations to the three women who. Yeah, matched. Debbie's rating average for the three rounds was 942. So, congrats to her. Phenomenal. All right. So that, that, that's the only B tier that we're going to talk about. We don't, yes. we don't usually bring them up, but because it was a world's preview, and we do have some of our bigger pros slumming it, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just playing at some of these lower tier local events. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and, and we all know that people are going to different courses for different reasons. A, this is going to be somewhat of a world's preview in terms of playing in Bedford. Uh, so I could assume that was going to had to be something with it. You're just overall proximity to it. Uh, that's going to play as a factor into it. And then you look at, like you kind of said just a little while ago, some players have more of a luxury than others in terms of if you feel like you need to play more golf, do you need to make more money? Do you have obligations to any given sponsors about the amount of events that you play in or the coverage in which you get? Those are all the types of factors that can come into playing. And I know there's plenty of you saying, well, why isn't so-and-so or such-and-such -such playing this weekend? Uh, you're going to see a lot of players obviously largely take off until you know the I disc golf pro tour all-stars or something of that nature unless they have just a really fun you know relatively close event or it might be a far away event but it's in a great destination that they have some other liking to or some other tie or implication that brings them there and there could probably be a full tournament in calvin heinberg's backyard and, and he'd be like yeah i'm good yeah, literally his backyard like yeah. he opens the back door yeah. and he's like no guys, okay, guys i'm good i'm just gonna sit and spectate yeah, yeah it just, it's some people just don't need it they want to take the time off and just not think about disc golf not i think kristen tatar said that she's going to take a month where she's barely going to touch a disc mm -hmm. and, uh, and then and then move from there let let me and to follow that up that is not far-fetched at all compared to what dozens of our pro tour type players, all of our top level professionals used to almost, almost in sync or in unison would say essentially the day or two after they got home from USDGC, mm -hmm. they would take their bag and they'd put it in their closet or they would stash it away and they literally wouldn't touch their disc for a month or more. Specifically, I, I always remember uh, Valerie and Nate saying that, that they would yeah. drive from South Carolina back out to Bend uh, over the last decade or so. They would drive all the way across the country, put their bags in the closet, and they may not get touched for a full like 60 or 90 days. And they were not at all unique it, in that scenario. No. Like there was a lot of golfers who just simply wouldn't touch or, or won't touch their discs. There's a lot of golfers still that won't. And I know last week I was kind of making the joke that, you know, some of our golfers, you know, you hear them frustrated or complain that the season's too long. And then the next day you see them out there playing golf and it's mostly recreational. But yeah, some will continue to uh, play a few of these other tournaments, which as we all know, the Dickerson's a warrior. He's going to play every event within about 100 miles of him and probably win it. That's just what he does. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll, we'll see what, uh, what he continues to take on. Um, I, I think the course has to be right. I, yeah, I think, again, I, every player has their own incentives as to why or where they'll go play and for what given reason. But yeah. you called it perfectly when you said, like, Calvin Heinberg couldn't care less about a tournament going on in his backyard. <laughs> um, just uh, different different strokes for different folks. Ray asks, Terry, have you ever gotten kind of sick of disc golf and taken a month off? <laughs> well, the funny thing is, like, we take months off of playing tons. Yeah, like, that, yeah. That's, I, that's I, nothing. I had to actually look for my bag a few weeks ago when I wanted to go play. I literally couldn't remember even where it was, if it was in but, storage or in my car or wherever. But there's but. never been a month in your life where you haven't done, you haven't <laughs> worked something disc golf. Correct. Yeah, yeah that would... Uh, I was going to say in the last 20 years since I've done disc golf full-time, but even before that, 
it Correct. wouldn't matter since probably 19 the last time that probably happened honestly was i would say around 95 okay. or 96 when i was in high school and that's before i discovered winter golf because one of the two main courses in in the area where johnny and iv johnny v and i grew up you the, think the main course that i loved playing was plumbing yep and they would take that out in like October ish, October, November, whatever it was. They take, they pull out the baskets, which is common. There's other activities. There's sledding. There's snowmobilers. There's other things going on in that park. Skiing and stuff. So they would take the baskets out of the ground. And I didn't know of or or actively participate at the other course that was 15 or 20 minutes away. It was the only other course, and that was 15 or 20 minutes away. And they left their baskets in all winter. And then finally, when some good friends kind of, I'll say, in, for lack of a better term, introduced the concept of playing in the winter when I was like 17 or whatever it was, that's when I would go play winter golf. That would probably be right around, because I used to, for the first couple of years, I did take my bag, all like nine discs I owned, and I would go put them in, a, in the closet. And then, like I said, within a year or two of that, well, I was thinking, when I found winter there, golf, there might have been like a January in college where we didn't play. No, because that was always like big freeze. So you were out oh, there practicing for right, the ice the bowl, <laughs> and then we were going. No, and then I was going to crack plastic in well, February. Plastic usually in February, big freeze was almost always the week before the Super Bowl. Yeah, and then two weeks later was crack plastic in yeah. Michigan, and then a couple, you know, and then shortly after that would be the MDGO series that's starting up, and yeah, the Ed no, Holtz. Right. The Ed Holtz we were playing in February, and I know. in ninety seven, ninety eight trophies in there. So <laughs> yes, at, some point, at some point we started running that event. Yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine, and and I will admit, a few people this weekend had also said, and a lot of people have said, like, oh, it's the off season. Just real quick, for me, <laughs> in this sense, not really, because I think about, um, you know, in, now in two, being in Vegas, now in two weeks, PLO, right? uh, Phoenix Ladies Open. Uh, shortly after that, we're going to have... Um, uh, I, I run, so when I'm not filming an event, I'm running cold turkey, which you've heard me talk about. That's in its 17th year. We'll be running that right after th the two days after Thanksgiving, uh, a C tier that's about three quarters sold out. Plus, we have the flex start. The weekend after that, Chainhawk Open, uh, now heading over to you know Gainesville. So I go to Phoenix and then Gainesville a few weeks later. And then we have Shelly Sharp, and then we have um uh, maricopa open and the next thing you know it's like malaysia thailand thailand and then we start the disco pro tour all-stars i think i have like legitimately one or maybe two weekends not currently scheduled in the next six months so are you going anywhere this weekend oh i got stuff to do you you'll see i know you got stuff to do i didn't know if you were going anywhere this weekend <laughs> yeah so it uh there's yeah, there's not all and and I will be the first to first of all I'm not complaining and second of all, um some of these relationships and some of these events like Chainhawk, which you know just kind of became a thing three, four years ago, uh working with the the crew at Maricopa, doing the Shelly Sharp, all of those. Uh I was in Florida for a few of those years. All of those have continued to just grow and thrive that were off season off season events. And now they've become kind of staples within my year, and uh, I look forward to each and every one of them. So, um, and it was great to be in Vegas this last weekend. So, all right, let's. Um, I did get an update. Seth Muncy a few minutes ago said he's about ten minutes out from uh, being with us, and so he'll be joining us here very soon. And what a great conversation to have! Again, somebody talking about the off season and able to uh, maybe give us a little bit of insight. You see a lot of people asking questions, people talking about their off-season routine. I just saw uh, Albert Tom, for instance, just today was answering questions on Latitude's page about what he's going to be working on in the off-season. And I think he he said something about uh, his, his touch. and He said putting <laughs> first. He has to. And then I mean. his second one was, you know, touch and finesse with, like, his his long-range drives. Oh, and then nice. also even his medium-range drive. He kind of wants to work on, like, his uh, somewhat of his a uh, uh, little bit on his approach game. And, it's, and then it really made me reflect for a minute. Like, could you imagine you had the year you did. You can go to UDISC if you want, even though you probably know the answers. And you can see, like, right there 
I was going to say in black and white, but they've got fancy graphics in blue and yellow and all these other colors. You could just look and be like, yeah, here's, here's, where, I, here's where I stack up against the field, and here's where I think I've failed. And some of them are so painstakingly obvious, you, you know, like an own Scoggins is just going to continue to practice putting to maintain where she is or try to. But then you look at some other players and you're like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, you don't, yeah. I say you don't think that, uh, like Antala is going to sit and work on a circle two putting, which he was at like 29% and the leaders are at 35 or, uh, or 40, 40. Per, 40% there, you, you know, Greg Barsby. I'm looking at, I just happen to sort by circle two and I'm scrolling down some of our bigger names that probably could use a little bit of yeah, help. Think, like think what, like, you know, Gavin Babcock's, you know, 37% birdie percentage is great, but uh, how much he could uh, pop up if he was converting more from circle two. Because yeah. clearly we all know he's got all the distance in the world, but if he connects on a few more circle twos, you know, yeah. I mean, we could look at literally every stat and then kind of reflect and think about like, yeah, what's that going to take or, or sort, sort, sort by OB rate. It should be a good, that's deal. a really hard thing to work on though. OB no, rate. well, but, but it, it is and it's not. No, I think it is. I mean, it's, you could uh, throw it, OB less. <laughs> yes, but it's, I would say then you're, that, that's more course management to me. Things like, uh, well, of course, circle two <laughs> in regulation, OB rate. That's more working on, Course management is, I think, more on the mental side because we know all these guys have the skills to keep it in bounds. It's just a lot of times how aggressive you're being. Uh, you know, fairways hit could probably be worked on with your with you know more driving skills, but I think the OB rate is just that'd be a very tough skill to work on. Other than maybe being less aggressive, that would be uh, okay. A, well, may, would, I, well, and that maybe less aggressive sometimes might be the answer to that is uh, more controlled drives, right? Yeah. You know, maybe maybe you're working on uh, something in that capacity. Yeah, it's just kind of interesting when you scroll and you look at uh, some of the stats. Again, you probably have a pretty good idea. You, I mean, yeah. th think about it this way. Paige Pierce, for the longest time, knew exactly where she ranked with OBs. She was always one of the worst, and she knew it. And, and like you said, that was relative to just overall how aggressive she was, but that's something that you could start to think about. So other things you could think about... <laughs> Disc golf strong. And with that, uh, wow, this guy just shows up, got a late invite, and still delivers. None other than Seth Muncy. He's going to join us right now. What's up, buddy? Hey, what's up, crew? So good I to see always, you, I always love it when a guest just shows up and their stuff works because we didn't get a chance to test. A lot of times we oh, test with yeah. players beforehand, and we work with them for 10, 15 minutes. They can't get it running, but you, you just show up. This guy's a pro. He's a pro. You know, a pro. This is not my, it's been a while since it's been, um, that I've been on Smash Fox, but it's not my first, it's not my first rodeo with y'all. <laughs> it is not. Speaking of rodeos, first of all, happy Halloween. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Uh, how did yeah, your, your girls enjoy vol uh, Halloween? Any, anything and, and uh, silly were, or crazy? What were they? What were they for Halloween? They, so Kaylee, my oldest. Uh, with strawberry shortcake and Layla, my 11 year old, she was a ghostbuster and, yes. uh, they nailed it. Yes. And I was the frozen dad out there that was <laughs> eating all the Reese's pieces and Reese's <laughs> peanut butter cups. Yeah. And, okay. uh, I, I, I told him, I said, you know, I, I told Tiffany today, I was like, you know, I'm going to fast. Like I already had lunch and I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say I'm fasting. And then, like, right away, as soon as my youngest daughter walks up and hands me a Reese's peanut butter cup, I was like, eh, I'll fast tomorrow. I'll fast tomorrow, exactly. <laughs> like, I just was trying to get through with no candy, and it just wasn't possible. Yeah, no, I mean, that's... it's Halloween, so you just got to go for it. I'm, su I'm, I'm surprised girls still dress up as strawberry shortcake these days. That feels like such an old reference and it's kind of a dated mm -hmm. thing. But yeah, maybe, maybe yeah, there's a modern cartoon I don't know for... about. Yeah, something old school. Yeah, I don't know what her influence was on why she chose that, but – yeah, no, but they killed it. Well, let, let's start there. I, as usual, we don't have an outline here or anything, but let's start there. Um, you know, you, of, of course, have always been so helpful to all of our pros and to everyone else that you know in terms of health, fitness, routines, diets, all of those things that, I, that I've largely ignored from you. But one of the things that you, you honestly, I, that I, is so refreshing is when you talk about people being on a routine and being on a diet and and or changing up their lifestyle when it comes to sweets when it comes to indulging i feel like you've always had the exact same response 
in talking to people when someone says, well, hey, I'm doing all this stuff, but then, you know, Halloween rolls around once a year. What, what do you say to people when, when, when they feel perplexed about, you know, that uh, a break in the system? I mean, there is no break in the system. You know, there is no falling off the wagon, really. I mean, we can say that, but, you know, we're living life. Like, you got to live life. And when I found just over many, many years of my life and, and coaching others, be, even before disc golf, I didn't start coaching in disc golf. I started coaching way before that. So, you know, just regular general fitness people. And, and you know, the, when they felt like they would uh, come up to a big ha- Halloween or, you know, a friend's birthday party or something, they would just feel so horrible about themselves. And it just did so, it, it was never a positive in their life. And, and so I've always been one that has talked about, you know, like it, we have, we have, we have our moments when we enjoy our, our, ourselves with, with whatever we're indulging in. And then we have our moments where we, you know, focus on our goals. And so I've always done it in moderation. I know we've talked about this, Terry is like, you know, 80% of the week I, uh, I fast or I, I make healthier choices. 20% of the week I eat whatever I want, you know? And I think just life has just become too strict. It's like, oh, I want to lose a little bit of body fat or I want to do this. So that's like, well, you got to go on some extreme training. And you got to go on some extreme nutrition. And then people are like, ah, maybe, maybe next year. Mm-hmm. And so it's just, it's just never good for anyone because it's never, it's never something you can actually uh, you know, reach is it's not something you can never start. And so that's never been my philosophy. And I, I feel good with, with how I coach it, how I live it myself. And, and, um, yeah. Yeah. I, and I think that's just so crucial because like you said, it feels like such an extreme and if people have feel whether it's guilty or whatever, and you've, you've said like, eat, eat the damn ice cream, you're going out for a birthday party, you eat the ice cream. You're, you're not going to gain 10 pounds and you're not going to erase everything you've done over the last two months because you had ice cream one night or whatever. And obviously be shocked at how much ice cream I can put down though, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously there's the moderation and so on and so forth. And you can't have, you know, a birthday party six nights a week, but you know, yeah, when it happens, just enjoy the moment, enjoy what you're doing and, and don't have that guilt. And I, I've always just appreciated just that hearing that from someone, uh, you know, as professional as yourself, because I feel like that's an easy question or an an often asked question is like, well, what do I do in this case? It's like, you've said it, eat the cookie, eat the ice cream or have the, you know, have some candy one night out of the, you know, the month because it's Halloween. Like you're not, you know, yeah. Yeah. You don't know how many fitness conferences I've been to over, over many, many years where, you know, I'm, I'm going out to dinner at a fitness conference somewhere and I'm with people that, you know, what they put on social media and what they share in their newsletters and stuff is just like very strict. And, it, you know, and then I'm sitting there as they're putting down an entire pizza, you know, and it's like <laughs> what they're telling other people, they feel like they have to live up to that image online, but they can't even do it themselves. And so I remember going to this fitness conference uh, back in like 2008 or nine, and it was a uh, it was called Meeting of the Minds, and it's out. It was out in um, Arizona. It was like three days long, and what it was, it was like all these amazing presenters, and we would spend two hours listening to each presenter. We all stayed at the same hotel, and they all had they had catered breakfast, lunch, and dinner for all of us. So we'd all like, so it was like you don't get just get to listen to the presenters. You get to like hang out and have a beer with them and stuff, right? So there's this one uh, gentleman, Dr. John Berardi, and he started this uh, company called Precision nutrition and it's it's really big and so john berardi is like the guru in like nutrition and everything so john is there and we all get up and there's this long line of food and then there's this long dessert table and everyone's like looking at john berardi was like is he gonna step near that dessert table and as soon as i mean he walks over and grabs a bunch of dessert all of us were like Whew, okay like, we're good we're good everyone raid the dessert table <laughs> no, uh, you know, it was just like, you know, he just understood. And that's why he's been so success- successful in what he does is that, you know, things in moderation, but if we feel bad about ourselves, whether it's nutrition, whether it's our mental, you know, skills or mental state, or whether it's our fitness, you know, whatever that means to anybody, like if we feel good about ourselves and, and the progress we're making, the action steps that we're taking, uh, we're going to see much more benefit. 
both in the short term and the long term. Uh, right now, there's a lot of players. We've been talking about how the offseason is essentially upon us for most people. And throughout the year, you hear players frequently talk about, you know, what they're doing in season versus what their off season is going to look like. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. And so I've heard that from a number of players, but to you, if, if you were a disc golfer that was playing on the same, you know, routine as these guys week in and week out, what are some of the either ge generic or specific philosophies you'd start taking into a November 1st tomorrow if that was kind of your first official off-season day what are some of the types of things that you either are instructing or that you personally would be doing yeah well so for the players on tour and you know and it really even for anyone because it's a it's a long season I've been saying this for many years I'm sure I said this on your podcast two years ago is the best thing about disc golf is you can play every day and the worst thing about disc golf is you can play every day, you know. Um, so we have a we have a volume uh, issue in our sport. Uh, we have a volume challenge. We have an intensity challenge. Uh, we have a variability challenge. I mean, we have so many challenges that we're out there just throwing all the time, and so the body doesn't get the rest that it needs, the rest that it deserves. And so it's starting out with just like do some recovery have some really focused recovery. Now there's active recovery and there's passive recovery. Passive recovery is like, I'm not doing anything. Sure, like if that's what you need, do that. Like do that for a week or so. Like, But active recovery is, you know, you're actively doing things. You're doing some soft tissue work. You're focusing on, you know, doing some gentle, good mobility work for areas like your upper back and your hips. Things that you've just been stressing a lot. Uh, you know, like say for the players on tour, they've been, sitting and and i've been on tour you know for years but the last three years you know working full-time for the tour uh you know traveling full-time to every tournament and i mean you're you're sitting in that car you're sitting in that rv a lot and uh so doing some gentle mobility work for that upper back and those hips and those ankles and then just things that feel good right now like there's going to be time uh, coming up soon for things that really challenge you, but I always just tell them like start start with some decompression mm. from the season. So like if people at home and they're you know they've been playing all season long and now it's starting to get colder and I know really that the season doesn't stop for many AMs. Like there's a lot years ago the season didn't stop for most pros. Now it's starting to stop or at least slow down significantly for for most of the pros on tour they're starting to really be like okay i need i need a little bit of time and there's still some that i talk to they're like oh i got like six seven more tournaments before mm -hmm. thanksgiving i'm like huh, that's crazy um but uh so that's that's what i would start with right there is just some recovery some active recovery go for some walks uh you know and then start moving into the essentials of like over an off season, we build a base. So we start with some core work and get some core activation, some planks and some side planks and some shoulder stability work and some hip stability work. So it's not go in the gym, start doing kettlebell swings, start doing some, you know, crazy advanced exercises, start simple, start things you can, uh, you know, you can implement right away. Um, so I can dive down deep rabbit holes of, of <laughs> exercise and training and stuff. So I'll keep it there and then, and then, you know, go from your prompts on uh on where to go next. Also, is, is this like fighting work? Is this a fighting shirt? I just want to make sure it's not. No, no not I all, mean, we, we love those guys. Okay. I mean, we've, we've, we're okay, neighbors. Good. I, I figured. <laughs> it's not like a Vikings shirt or, you know, anything no, like yeah. that. You're, you're, we I love our Minnesota that, but... Frisbee brethren. Yeah. And the fact that the MFA was, it was such an impactful and powerful, you know, organization. Is it forty or fifty years they're celebrating? I think it's forty next year. That would make sense. I it might be so. fifty, even though. Yeah. Yeah, they've been around for a long time, um, and uh, or they're going to be soon celebrating. A, it might even be their fiftieth in in twenty twenty four twenty five. So, uh, yeah, good good people. We we have a lot of love for Illinois. Uh, uh, excuse me, I was, okay. <laughs> Illinois. Whoa. A lot of love for Minnesota. <laughs> Illinois, that would be a different story. There's there's a little more of a rivalry uh, when it comes to them. But MFA, all good stuff. Um, so these players, um, is there a point where? Well, let, let's let's back up for one quick second. I think of two players in particular, and I, I think this is common knowledge. So I don't mind calling them out by name. I hope they don't mind. 
Uh, Paige Pierce, for instance, has talked about for so many years not not having cruise control and and what it's been like driving a van or a vehicle around and just like you said those long drives and what that can mean on your on your hips or just on your positioning especially without cruise and then i think of like a a a kyle um uh that we saw kyle this year really struggle uh with his back and in hearing that again some of these long drives and these you know people think oh you're in a car what are you complaining about Eight, ten, twelve hours in a in a big vehicle, and if even if you're taking occasional rest breaks, that's not exactly an easy task. And then even if you're not doing that, that means you're flying everywhere, and that isn't necessarily mm-hmm. comfortable either. So, mm-hmm. dare I ask is 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 there what is the best solution? What's the best way to combat some of this? Yeah, it's a it's a challenge. I mean, you know, like sitting, it's like oh well, I'm just sitting, but you know, sitting is not. Sitting's a nat, like it's a human position that we should be able to get in, but it o- over time, uh, it's not a like a human movement thing. Like humans are made to do like human movement things, and just sitting, and especially sitting in one position for that long, um, while you're engaging, you're engaging some muscles to you know gas break things like that. You, that's just not something that our bodies were naturally designed to do. And so to do it at any point, but even to do it for long, long stretches is it's tough. It's tough on the body there. You know, we think about truckers, we think lots of people that just spend a lot of time there. Terry, I think what well, you probably travel like 70,000 miles a year in an airplane. So, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a lot, a lot of sitting. So what do we do to combat it? One thing I've, you know, talked with players about is, and not with each player individually. I'll just, you know, talk to players that have had some issues or, you know, when, when they want to talk about these kind of things, I don't just walk up to players and say, hi, hey, I need to talk to you. You know, like <laughs> sure. we, we need to have a conversation. Uh, so, but is, is getting up is like taking, taking those rest breaks and using that time that are already kind of just going to happen as you're driving long distances. You need to get out to use the restroom. You need to get out to grab some food. You need to get out to, you know, fill up your tank. And so taking some, taking uh, advantage of those times, those periods to get some activation of your muscles. So I've had players where I have them do standing planks where they just like stand up nice and tall and they brace their abs like they're bracing for a punch, squeeze their glutes like they're pinching core between their cheeks, grab all their, just like engage all their muscles and do that for like 10 seconds. It's a standing plank. Do some hip circles, some leg swings, some upper back movement. So while the gas is filling up, you know, while the mm-hmm. while you're waiting, you know, for your food, things like that, you know. And so we can't get away right now from the movement. We can't get away from the travel. I know that, you know, things are trying to – they are evolving to, to have – not as big stretches as we as we've had in the past, but you just got to look for those little windows of time. Look for those little windows of time that you can start getting your body moving. What are you know as you move into the you know you're saying not necessarily to jump right into a bunch of you know advanced techniques and things, but what are some of the players coming to you and talking to you about with regard to their off season and and you know. Is it very individualized for every single player, or do you kind of have some blanket general ideas for how they should be going about it? Uh, it yeah. yeah. How do you break that down? Yeah, great question. So for any athlete, you want to have a good foundational base. And that's and that's not just like a pro athlete, like that an amateur athlete, which you know, I've been saying this since since Disc Golf Strong's inception is like calling all disc golfers athletes like hey athlete Mm -hmm. hey disc golf athlete because no matter who we are no matter what division we play how long we're playing we're doing an athletic movement our the the sport demands us of it uh you know and so uh getting that foundational base so it's like we're working on core stability we're working on hip stability we're working on shoulder stability like when i throw when when any athlete disc golfer throws Let's just say the shoulder. The shoulder wants to it, – it's the most mobile joint in the body, and that's a great thing. But it's also a really challenging thing when you're trying to throw your arm out of your socket, you know, constantly throughout the week. And so it's like we need a lot of stability 
in that shoulder joint. So it's not necessarily super advanced stuff. It's and and it's not even if it's a top level pro. Uh, you know the the foundational human movements and the movement patterns that our body needs, we do them. So one thing I do with players and. This is one misconception I think that just happens just naturally in in sports and when you think about professional athletes is that um, they think that professional athletes do like the professional movements and like the the cool the crazy stuff the stuff you see on you know Instagram you know things like that but that's not true like it, my background is is you know I've I've had the a great opportunity it, it's a a privilege that I've, I've had to work with some top level strength and conditioning coach and then call some, you know, some of them, my friends that, you know, work in the NHL. I worked for a professional hockey team as an intern strength coach. And when I got there, I thought they were going to be doing the craziest moves. I'm like, these are NHL players. We're going to be doing all sorts of advanced stuff. And we weren't, we were doing the foundational stuff. We we're doing planks, side planks, dead bugs, bird dogs, half kneeling work, um, some kettlebell presses, like nothing crazy one because that's what they needed um and two like our job wasn't to try to impress them off the ice our job was to do the stuff that was necessary so that they could impress everyone on the ice and so we didn't do the crazy stuff uh and uh, so the people see my stuff online like Why, where's all the crazy stuff um, i've been telling all the players for years like you need to earn intensity you need to earn complexity you need to earn you know, volume, like you need to earn all this stuff. And so I, that's what I encourage for the, the general disc golf athlete at home too, is like, don't worry about doing all the crazy stuff. Worry about doing the stuff that's going to make the biggest impact. And so, um, cause there's also a risk versus reward. Like if I have, you know, a player doing some sort of crazy exercise and he gets injured, you know, and now the now he his his or her season is over, or they've lost now this big contract. I'm like, yeah, but look how many likes we got on social media. Like, doesn't that mean something? <laughs> like, 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 is that not is that not valuable? Uh -huh. um, yeah. I, so yeah, I think I I think I saw one football player was maybe it was in the off season. He was you know one foot balancing on one of the uh, one of the half half balls while someone throws different sized balls at him, and he's catching them with like one hand and then it was like oh i can do it blindfolded and and he would just tell him like right hand left hand and it was it was kind of those type of ridiculous workouts that they show their hand-eye coordination and and their balance but all i kept thinking is you know the wrong move and you're gonna blow out your knee <laughs> that that's that you know you never and, and i not to put any coaches coach down they all have their own methods and their reasoning uh, you know hopefully of why they do things um, and why they make certain decisions, but you never see, it's hard. To, it's, it's rare. You see those videos and then you're like, Oh, that coach is the coach of the Chicago bears or that sure. coach is the coach of whatever, you know, like it's, it's usually not them because they're like, yeah, we're doing the stuff that works and we're not doing the stuff that's going to risk. I, I've, I had someone one time ask me, he's, he showed me a video of him doing a, uh, a, a jump. Uh, onto a big box, onto like a Bosu ball, which is like the half yeah. ball, mm -hmm. yep. like inflatable ball, right? And landing on a single leg. And he was like, what do you think? Do you think this would be good for disc golf? And I'm like, first, that's impressive. Thanks for showing me. Like, that's cool. <laughs> you know, you did that. <laughs> but but no, I would never do that. And he's like, why not? You know, there's a lot of, a lot of good that comes out of that. And I was like, you know, my job, my job as a coach is to be uh, like a commercial airline pilot. Like a commercial airline pilot can go into an air show and watch an acrobatic pilot fly their plane upside down, stall in midair, do all sorts of crazy stuff, and they can clap and scream and be like, oh, that, that's amazing. They would never do that in their plane, right? Different goals. Like both pilots, different goals. Like everyone claps when you, you know, get to the uh, – when you get on ground on time or early with the <laughs> fewest bumps possible. Everyone's yeah. like, this is the best pilot in the world, you know? Like yeah. <laughs> that's like – that's my goal as a coach is to go, what, what path are we going? What's the most efficient way to get there? What's going to be the least risky, have the least amount of turbulence and, and make sure that we arrive on time 
And so that's where I, that's where my philosophy comes from. Well, I mean, I think there's an analogy there too with, in terms of the basics, you talked about not doing the crazy stuff or worrying about the super advanced stuff. You could directly apply that to your disc golf practicing. Like, man, mm-hmm. I really want to be able to make all these circle two putts. I'm, you know, I'm really going to dial in from, from 60, 62 feet. You know, that's just going to be a, a spot I'm going to work hard on. And I'm going to try and throw, you know, 600 feet. Uh, okay. First mm-hmm. of all, make all your damn 20 footers, right? Like mm-hmm. get the, like legitimately get the basics. You down. probably have less 60 footers than you do 20 <laughs> footers. And so if, yes. even if you hit every 60 yes. footer, that's two strokes you've gained maybe on a round as exactly. opposed to hitting every 30 footer where you've now, you, <laughs> that's five strokes. Yeah. So <laughs> get all the basics down, make everything from 20 to 25 and in. So get those basics down. And before you're worried about throwing 650 feet that may go anywhere, how about you throw 400 feet wherever you want? Like, let again, yeah. like, it's just, it's the same exact thing about, like, let's get the basics nailed first. And, like, let's... I can let's... throw 400 feet wherever I want. Because <laughs> I throw 350. Well, not whenever I, you want, though. <laughs> I throw 350 or 300, then I lay up to 100 feet. That's yeah, easy. That's, like, <laughs> it just takes me two yeah, shots yeah, to yeah. get there. <laughs> so, there, there yeah, is, we, I, yeah. <laughs> we have a philosophy that I, I preach at, at Disc Golf Strong, which is, is throw putters first. And I'm like, it's... You know, it's the analogy, the philosophy of throwing putters first, where like you go to any pro, uh, you know, and if they, if someone walked up to them with a, you know, 12 speed driver in their hand said, Hey, I'm new to disc golf, you know, what, what, how should I throw this? They'd be like, well, let's get some putters in your hand. Let's throw, yeah. let's throw some putters first. Even if that's not how they learn at this point, they would be like, that's a better way to learn than just throwing high speed stuff and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. One of the challenges of our sport um is uh that we can get good really fast and we can play a lot we can get good really fast right it's like oh what is this oh a frisbee oh it's called discs it's called it's called disc golf six months later it's like oh i might go mpo you know it's (laughs) like and 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 the thing is and even if they don't they think that they can get there and while the while that's while that's cool you know, while that, that that is a nice feature of our sport, it's also a challenging feature of our sport because, you know, you would never go to like a major league baseball player and say, hey, you guys ever do like, you know, uh, the fundamentals? And like, <laughs> I've, I've been doing the fundamentals since I was like six, <laughs> you know, like, they, you know, I, I remember going to a Yankees Angels uh, playoff game one time and I was watching uh, Derek Jeter and uh, A-Rod uh, and out there and they were t- taking ground balls. And they were throwing them to first and they were things they've been doing since they were like six years old. And that was part of their warm. I mean, it was the fundamentals. It was the fundamentals. They weren't just out there trying to hit home runs the whole time during batting practice, you know, warming up for the game. And so the more like we try to, we tend to push away the basics and we tend to uh, uh, think negatively of the basics. Like, Oh, well that like, that's what like beginners do. Mm-hmm. you know or you know and and it's like you know you've been playing disc golf for <laughs> six months like you know you, you like do the basics drill the basics drill the basics like and that's good like we want that and we want you know bruce lee was brilliant at the basics that's why he was so good you know and and, and what he did and I've, I've been saying this for a long time is everyone wants to I got to add more people to the list now, but I used to back in the day be like, everyone wants to do what Paul, Ricky and Eagle do, but very few people want to do what Paul, Ricky and Eagle do. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and I would say that because you'll be like, Oh, what is Ricky doing? What is Paul doing? What are Eagle doing? And there was others on that list. I would just, you know, say those three, but it was like, they're out there, they're drilling the fundamentals. They're doing, getting really good at the things that they know that they need, uh, you know, to win. They're not just going and emptying their bag all day, you know, and this is not a, you know, it's not putting down anyone that, that does that. It's just we got to we gotta make sure that we're doing – we're going the smart path, you know, yeah. to success. Smart yeah. path. And, and I'll say – yeah, go ahead. No, all I was going it, to – it's a side note that if you're not taking those ground balls, you know, if you're – if Derek Jeter and A-Rod, like, you're not dating Mariah Carey. I mean, there's, there's, a, clear, <laughs> there's a clear path here, folks. And if you yeah, want some yeah. of that crazy, you've got to be on the right path. Okay, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. One <laughs> last thing to say this is I was talking to a player uh, um, years ago. He sent me some videos of him throwing, and, and he was an up-and-comer. He's a really good player now. And he was – he's like, 
Seth, I want to hit 500 feet. Like, what am I doing? Like, look at my form. Like, why can I not hit 500 feet? And I'm like, I'm trying to make sure I don't say his name. I said, you got to earn 500 feet. Like, yeah, you may be able to hit 500 feet once or twice, but you don't want to hit 500 feet. You want to earn 500 feet. Because if you earn 500 feet, you walk that path to get there, and now 500 feet's in your bag. It's not just something that you're going to hopefully put it, your hand in your bag and pull 500 feet out. No, you have 500 feet because you earned it. You did the strength training. You did the, all the other stuff that you needed to do to get there. And now 500 feet is in your bag. It's not in your magic bag that you're reaching in there trying to hopefully pull out. Yeah, I. Th it's that consistency and the fundamentals. And, and it's kind of similar when you just said, uh, you know, going out with a putter. You mm -hmm. after every world championship, I can't, I can't even recall how many world champions. When you ask them, "Hey, what was the key to your success or what worked well?" They'd always be like, "Yeah, I putted. I putted for the last month. I I put extra putting in in the last week or whatever that mm -hmm. time frame was." Some of them were naturally already talented and gifted in the putting department, but then they put that extra emphasis on, and th that's what they did: is they went out and did extra work in terms of their putting. And and we say the same thing when mm -hmm. someone it for a lot of people it feels very unsexy and i i just said it to someone this weekend i didn't go out to the field and throw a ton although we tell everyone else so just like you're saying that's one of the basics you have to go to the field you have to pick points you have to go to you know go to a football field or uh, or a, a baseball diamond is great as well or a soccer field or whatever things that have these marks on them and practice different skills with those and it might feel mm -hmm. boring or 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 you know not exciting or or i guess that's another word for boring it is boring, just yeah yeah it, it you, can be but you still have to do it yeah and that's that's where you're going to learn so if you, much if more you, if you want to excel yeah so mm -hmm. well, you you wear a lot of hats in our industry mm -hmm. like not just your disc golf mm -hmm. strong hat um you also work mm -hmm. with the pdga uh, are you on the medical committee or are you more of are you more of a consultant for the medical committee uh i chair it you chair the medical committee as well as working with the Disc Golf Pro Tour on, mm -hmm. you know, f for what is your position with the Disc Golf Pro Tour exactly? My official title is Director of Health, Safety, and Sports Performance. Health, Jeez. Safety, and Sports Performance. I, I get to listen in on the, the Thursday calls, and you're always, I mean, you're mm -hmm. very, every, I think you're, you're usually one of the last people to speak. You're always talking about mm -hmm. making sure everyone takes on the team, not just the players, but the team takes care of themselves. Our guys that do these long hauls mm -hmm. for the course, get out, stretch, do, do, you know, do the things. But then you also get to safety, which is a lot mm -hmm. of our, our weather, you know, our weather delays. We've had, a, mm -hmm. we've had, a, we had, I want to say a ton of them, but it felt like early in the season, they, they tended to creep up. Where does your experience come from in that avenue? Is that something you had to learn? Is that something you've, you worked with people because I don't think you're a meteorologist. I'm not sure though. He's he's <laughs> he's got his degree, uh, uh, almost got uh, his degree by now. But go ahead. I, and what I are the tools like that one, you use yeah. to do those things? Explain that for everyone. Yeah, I feel like a meteorologist sometimes. Uh, yeah, so on site as the safety director, I'm doing emergency action planning leading up to the tournament uh, in the weeks and months leading up, to working with the the local committee, the local crew to you know make sure we're doing course hazard mitigation, make sure that we're We've got emergency action plans in place. So in the event that there's severe weather, if we're in areas where there's, you know, potential tornadoes that could happen, things like that, where are the shelters? How are we getting people there? Um, how are we evacuating the course? How are we, you know, where's the closest hospital? Where's the closest ambulances? Um, where's the, the best paths on and off the course? So I'm also the on-site emergency medical responder. So if there's a any sort of medical emergency on site, I'm the first one to go out there and have an AED and a medical bag and stuff. And so there's a lot that goes in on the safety side as well. And yeah, uh, weather is definitely one of them that that's uh, my responsibility. Um, it's something I don't I don't take lightly. I, I'm very much, you know, involved heavily in not only the, the learning of weather, I study weather patterns all the time. Now, um, I I don't just watch like Ryan Hall, y'all on YouTube. I watch, you know, I'm <laughs> studying meteorology. I'm studying weather patterns. I'm studying how tornadoes form. Um, I'm, I, 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 my background before, uh, before disc golf 
was I started out uh, working in the Coast Guard. I went in 99, joined the Coast Guard, and I was in uh, San, Francisco, San Francisco as a doing search and rescue in federal law enforcement. So I was there from 99 to 03 uh, doing, doing that job. So my whole, my whole world was search and rescue. My whole world was law enforcement, was critical decision-making in the moment. Things are happening, boats taking on water, something. We've got to make decisions fast. So that, that, you know, is, that experience is something that has helped me in my role today of things are happening, things are changing fast, things need, decisions need to be made. After that, I spent about six years working on an ambulance, doing 911 calls and working as a part-time firefighter. So similar experience, just in the moment, incident command, things are happening. Everyone, you know, we've got to get lots of pieces involved, you know, lots of high stress. And so I really, I really lean on that experience, but I don't just lean on that experience in the fact that if my job is weather, right, it, like it's, Weather is one thing, but we- the, the actual weather that's coming in, like that's a very small piece of it. Like mm-hmm. the, the bigger part is the, are we getting the emergency action plan in place? Are we getting people off the course? Where's the shelters? You know, what, what's happening through that whole process, both in the planning, in the implementation, and in the after, after action steps. So that's where I really lean heavily on my a decade of experience doing that. Um, and so I have a meteorologist that's on staff as well that I brought on this past year. Um, Austin has been great. And so I, I lean on him as well. And it's great that, you know, since I study, like I study meteorology and I study all this stuff because, you know, like on an ambulance, like it didn't, it wasn't going to be enough if I just thought it was really cool to be working in an ambulance. Like I had to study and, and really drill down what would happen in this situation what would happen in this situation how would i handle these kind of things you know you 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 get your confidence level goes up without being cocky at all like you can't like that's how people get injured on you know and those kind of things so it's but you have to always have a really good grasp of what's going on so that's what i try to always make sure i'm doing with the weather is i'm trying to study it but it's all that other stuff so now i have the meteorologist Austin, who, you know, we're talking all the time. Uh, we're connecting. He's given me some uh, updates of what he's seeing. I'm looking at the weather reports and kind of calculating everything in my head of like, how fast is the storm coming in? What is the storm prediction center? What have they, uh, you know, in the days leading up, what have they kind of predicted for our area for thunderstorms, for severe weather, for tornado risk, things like that. Um, yeah. And so, so it's a, it's a, it's a process. It's, you know, I, as I tell the players on, on the ground and, you know, I'm not some suit up in New York, that's just pushing a button, you know, uh, I'm out there, I'm with them. I don't want them to stop play. That's the last thing I want, but I'm always going to choose the health and safety, uh, life safety of, of everyone first. And so that is, that's, that's, you know, my, my main focus. Um, yeah, where do where do you want to go from there? Well, I I, could, I, I was just gonna say what I take away that is that is from the internet. I was told that you don't know I anything, knew this was coming. and that um, <laughs> really you're just not you just it's just a mega major ego trip for you to be pulling yeah. people off courses because <laughs> not only is that beyond of course ridiculous and stupid, arguably one of the dumbest things I read this entire year. If I'm being honest, like when I think back on 2023, some of the comments which are always a doozy. Uh, someone said, I think Seth has an ego problem. I don't even know if they called you up by name because they didn't even know because they're not, weren't smart enough. And all I kept thinking is a, that's obviously the furthest thing from the truth of you having any kind of ego problem or feeding an ego. But secondly, no, nobody on the planet wants our events and weekends to to go longer to stretch (laughs) like the camera crews, the, the people in the control room, the on-site volunteers, the on like you, the, the spe- players, the spectators, the spe- nobody, nobody <laughs> wants to turn 12 and 14 hour days into 16 or 18. Hour. Like nobody on the yeah. planet is benefiting, uh, personally outside of their safety is benefiting by us making everything take longer. And yeah. so the, for a multitude of reasons, that's obviously with such a, you know, but 
as we've seen more of these weather delays and maybe even additional precautions, it also then comes with additional scrutiny. And, and I think specifically of one, and I, and I know you, there are certain terms and obligations you have with the pro tour about being able to dis- discuss every, you know, maybe some situations, but one of the wilder situations this year was of course getting pulled off the course at Maple Hill for wind. And, and that, you know, truth be told, all three of us have been in disc golf for quite some time. And there was a lot of scrutiny over that <laughs> by some smart and not so smart people, but there was a lot of scrutiny over that. And and let's just call it what it is. It was incredibly unique. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's just really for most of us has rarely, if, if maybe even never happened or even heard of. Do you feel like that was so extreme that we may never see it again? Or do you feel like that was you and, and the pro tour kind of also maybe not taking safety even, even more seriously than ever before? Or, I mean, you've always taken it seriously, but I mean, you know what I mean? Like, is, is, are we even more cautionary than ever before for, for a number of reasons? Yeah. What, is, is, can you pinpoint any of that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, uh, um, every single decision is hard. Um, you know, and I've one thing I've told uh, one of my crew, they were asking about it. You know, they're like, oh man, you know, people, the people, things people are saying online. I said, you know, I, I, I just can't think about that when I'm, when I'm doing this, or else I'll always make the wrong call. You know, if I, mm-hmm. if I ever think, oh, what are they going to say about, you know, this, or what's the backlash going to be? I'm always going to, you know, make the wrong call. And that's, that's like our number one goal is to make sure that everyone is as safe as possible and that, you know, everyone goes home. And the thing with safety, the challenging thing with safety. And, you know, again, like this ain't, this is, you know, I've, I, you know, I could, someone, some could say fortunate, but some could say unfortunate the experience of being around a lot of people's, you know, worst, worst moments in their last, their last days. And so in, in my line of work before disc golf. And so, you know, you, you, when you see that, you really take it to heart, what, what things can happen. People never think about or not, not people, I don't want to generalize everyone, but many people don't think about what could happen at any moment in their life. And that's a good thing. We don't want to walk around just completely scared of, you know, never making it through the next moment. But everyone that I ran calls on, on an ambulance or on the, on the Coast Guard, like they never, they never imagined that what was going to happen in that moment was going to happen. Like, you know, and so it relies on us, like anyone on, on site at an event, uh, they put their trust in us that we're going to keep them as safe as possible. Right now, is there risk? There's always risk, right? We're not trying we're not trying to get rid and remove all risk. There's just a level of risk that we all assume just doing anything, right? And so if we were trying to uh, to minimize all risk, make risk zero, we, would, we wouldn't do any disc golf in the woods or, or, you know, in most areas. But when that level of risk gets to a, le- to a level that we're not comfortable with, then we have to we have to go down the path of making the calls and making the tough decisions that are, you know are not going to be uh, you know they're not going to always be well you know well recepted um, but we have to do what we have to do so in a case like in a case like uh, Maple Hill you know it wasn't necessarily the wind it was what's the what are the what are the trees doing what's that mm-hmm. old forest doing at that, at that, you know, level of wind. And so like heavy winds in Emporia, I mean, that's like a Tuesday, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Today, right? So, uh, it, it, in, in Massachusetts at Maple Hill, where the the old growth forest like that, when the trees start, when the wind started to get to a level when the gusts started to get to a level where we were seeing trees and some branches started to fall out. It's not like, Hey, there's a branch that fell blow the horn. Just, you know, we can't do that. It's okay. We knew that wind was forecasted. If I, if I blew the horn and didn't even allow the tournament to start in the morning, because I knew that the wind was going to come up that day, like, you know, 
that that would be really out there. You know, a lot of people would really, you know, be criticizing that. And um, and so we waited to see how's the how's the forest going to react to the wind and and the forecast as it's as it is uh, set throughout the day. So we walk out there and I do a do a survey. I do a you know evaluation of the wind. I'm looking up high. I'm looking at you know what are the tops of the trees are doing. Not necessarily because we got some you know some good elevation change with the hills there. So you may be in certain areas where you don't feel the wind, but that doesn't mean that it's not pushing the tops of those trees and really stressing them, mm-hmm. right? And so we have to make the call that we feel is going to be the safest. Uh, in the moment um, for everyone. Now, again, we're not trying to stop all wind uh, and stop playing all wind. And so when we felt it got to a level where we were like, it's there's still wind, but it's at a level of risk that all of us are willing to assume, then we, you know, make that decision to restart play. And, and it's not, it's, again, it's not easy. Um, it's not something that anyone, myself, you know, definitely cherishes is, you know, I, I accept that responsibility. That is my role and I want to do it the best I can and make the best calls I can. And I do that through the pre-planning, through the education, through, you know, the implementing the policies, you know, having those policies, working with the meteorologist, um, incident command, things like that. And so that's where, you know, we're hopefully we don't see that again. Uh, you know, I, I definitely don't want to, but we'll be prepared for it, you know, if it does, if it does come. Well, and we, we've seen things like that. We saw that a couple of years ago at USCGC when the hurricane, we were catching that, uh, clipping the edge of the hurricane. There was a large branch, I believe it was on hole four that had fallen, um, where they actually ended up just calling the event, uh, three rounds in mm-hmm. or four rounds in. And maybe was that, was that a five round? No, it was three rounds. Was three and round. that's how okay. calling... I couldn't remember. Managed to win that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I couldn't remember if it was a three and got cut yeah. down to four. But so, I mean, it's it's not unheard of. And it's something we obviously need to keep keep track of and, and, and monitor because some of our, that, that particular time of the year for USDGC and Maple Hill, it's hurricane season. I mean, you're catching, mm-hmm. it's not uncommon to catch some of those, you know, late season hurricanes yeah. that come up right up the coast. So, and both of those events, obviously yeah. relatively close to the coast. So the other situation that we saw, and we saw somebody on the board mention it, a, a tough, difficult situation was the cameraman that Eagle, uh, unfortunately brained, <laughs> um, his Halloween costume was apparently a disc in a hat, which was on social media. So I saw that, ha- yeah. half a disc, which good, good on him for having a sense of humor about it. How do you, how do you prepare for something like that? And do, would you think that is the most difficult situation you ran into all year or maybe even so far in your career on the disc golf pro tour? Uh, the actual injury yeah, or, or just this, like in general, an incident, the incident or injury, particularly for, on the pro tour. I know clearly in your life before this, this situation isn't probably even in the, doesn't even probably rank in the top 20, unfortunately, but uh, for the pro tour, I would say. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's probably not the worst call I've had on site at a at a disc golf event for sure. Um, it's it appeared to be the worst because the head bleeds um, mm-hmm. pretty well, and so and, and and it definitely did not you know it was not a it was a it it hurt for sure. Um, but you know I would say that. You know, to prepare for things like that, we're always learning. We're always growing. You know, we're a growing sport. New policies, new things happen. We're we're trying to be as forward thinking as we can. Um, you know, and then sometimes things happen like that where it's like, okay, now let's let's look at this next step of like, you know, headwear. You know, for for cameras, for camera uh, operators. So um, yeah, it's it's unfortunately not the the, the worst thing that I've seen on, on the road in over the years, but, uh, definitely not a, not a fun event for, for him or for anyone involved. And I'm glad that, uh, and I'm, I know everyone involved Eagle him, like the cameraman I was glad, glad that it, that it turned out to be, uh, in the end, not as gruesome as it could have been. I mean, because, you know, I got hit in the ear years ago, 
uh, right just right here at Huntington Beach um, uh, in a disc golf course, and it blacked me out for a second. Like I was just walking. I just happened to be walking with these two huge gym bros that I just met. I just met at the course, like a whole one. And they're like, Hey, you want to play in? I was like, yeah, sure. And we're, we're walking next thing. I like I'm walking with them a couple holes later. Next thing I know, I just feel like someone just bam hit me right in the ear and everything went black. I fell down. And then I like came to, to these guys, like looking around, yelling and cursing, like who threw that? Ah!" Like they were ready to like, just like <laughs> kill whoever like hit me. And so I'm trying to calm them down and I'm like, guys, guys, it's okay. It's okay. Because they just wanted to pulverize whoever <laughs> didn't yell for and just hit me upside the head. And so it's just, you know, those kind of things can unfortunately happen with, with injury. So we can't, we can't stop all of them. We're there to, we're there when they do happen. You know, I'm like I said, I'm on site. I, I, you know, to, to respond, um, and we just, we try to look at ways that we can implement policies and just SOPs in the future for camera people for, you know, our, our crew is amazing. Like our, our operations crew, they, you know, everyone's learning in this sport, like everything is growing all at the same time. And so having spectators on site and having lots of spectators and getting them moved around our operations team does a great job of moving a lot of people through the woods, through different areas. Now, you know, with, with they're using the, the rope and the, you know, things to be able to channel spectators away. So we're trying to limit the, the, the risk of that happening, limit it. We can't stop things like that happening, but, you know, definitely limit it. So, you know, we you just a big shout out to our crew for that. Um, yeah. Uh, I hope, you were at Huntington Beach, so I hope Macbeth at least came up and apologized after hitting you. I, I, I you just know, have to assume I think it was I've a throw told from him. him about that. <laughs> uh, I know, probably. I know. I think I've told him about that, and and yeah, I don't think it was him, but I could say it was him for yeah, sure. Okay, I okay. Say, I mean, you were blacked I, out. You may not. You may not know. So. Uh, <laughs> I know. Uh, you, you know, I know you, uh, of course, accolades to the crew and, and there are so many people that are, are there literally sun up to sundown, uh, you know, so many of the operations, the media crew and everyone in between, and along with the local volunteers, you're, you're there to warm up usually FPO players, sometimes six mm-hmm. thirty seven AM or earlier. And you're there until there's post round recovery and cool down exercises and everything else after the last players, uh, just kind of, mm-hmm. what, what does that mean for a, a, a day for you? And, and sometimes you don't even get to see the course, right? Uh, cause you're, you're doing other stuff. What's, what's that like for you? Yeah, I usually don't see the course during the tournament. Um, I'm out there prior to the tournament, um, to do course hazard walkthroughs, course mitigation, things like that. Um, emergency action planning, but during the tournament, I'm very rarely on the course these days. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm out there. I try to get out there, make sure that I'm out there an hour before the first FPO card tees off in the morning. Uh, you know, I think they deserve the time and, you know, and, and for me to be there to make sure that they get a proper warm up. Uh, and you know, I'm not, I'm saying, Oh, it's too cold or it's too, too early for me. No, like they're out there. I'm going to be out there for them. So I'm out there and then, yeah, I, I, I'm out there until, yeah, the last card finishes and then usually oh, quite a while after that. So my days are usually about 6 to 6.30 in the morning there on site and I'm usually headed off there 7.30, 8 o'clock or later sometimes. You know, sometimes we'll have, we'll have parts of the stretches where I'm out there, out of there earlier, maybe 5.30 or 6, maybe 6.30, but... Uh, yeah, it's a long day, you know, and, and we do it every day. And the, like you said, the operations crew, they've, you know, they're out there. And so they're, they're long days. And then we got to pack it up on Sunday nights and, and get it ready to go next, you know, for the next mm-hmm. tournament on Monday. Um, but, you know, we're excited. It's exciting to see the growth of the sport. It's exciting to see, you know, the growth of, of what is happening on site for sure, you know, and, and our team just in general, but yeah, it's a, I, I, I've been doing before disc golf, before working for the disc golf pro tour, I was out there for disc golf strong. Mm-hmm. And you know, I always made that, you know, even if it was just, it was just 
didn't have a contract to do anything just out there for him. I always felt like they deserve that, the FPO players, you know, to, to have somebody out there. So I pull up to Memorial, be pitch black, be the only car pulling up. And, and you know, that's just, I feel, as I build staff out and stuff, we're just going to make sure that happens. Like, it, they, you know, all, all athletes deserve to have that, um, the ability to have a coach there to guide them. So, so we've talked a lot about players off seasons and, and, you know, recovery. What does your off season look like? I mean, you, you, mm-hmm. so much of your time is spent in the moment on the disc golf pro tour that is, is this a, I don't say a mini vacation, but what do you, what is your November through February going to look like for Seth Muncie? Just eating Reese's. Just big it out on Reese's. <laughs> just, I got so much of them stacked up now. <laughs> My kids at the jackpot tonight. Um, yeah, it's you know it doesn't it doesn't stop for us uh, in the off season because we have a you know we have a full stack of events to to plan for and the uh, the events have to be planned for well in advance and so we're working or I'm already working on emergency action plans for next year. I'm working on updating safety policies i'm working on you know updating inclement weather stuff just all different types of policies and procedures and planning for next year Um, what next year is going to look like for you know in in so many different facets Um, and so i can say that same as for you know our operations our media crew and stuff like that so uh and then i'm doing off season off season coaching off season training for people um through pro tour and through disc golf strong and so it's just a lot of you know, face to face virtually with people getting on, helping them out, helping them guide and then doing and then I just moved uh, to uh, Boise, Idaho, Meridian. It's right next to Boise. So um, uh, and when I moved here, Sarah Hokum, who's from Caldwell, not far away, she made sure to school me on this, her in Carolina <laughs> Halstead, that I needed to say Boise and not Boise, because if I say Boise, that's that's a dead ringer that you're not from the area. Oh. So you have to say it. Boise. 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 Yep. See. Like Boise. Boise. Like a Boise. Uh, yep. Okay. Boise. Yeah, no, no Z yeah, in Boise. there. Boise. Boise. Yeah. No. Boise. Boise. Yeah. Huh. So so they said you have to. So I was practicing and stuff. So I, I think okay. I've got it now. So I moved to Boise, Idaho. And so it's been really exciting to be here and um be in part of the club scene i'm just starting i just got off the road and so you know even though my family's been here i think i was home like 19 out of 97 days or something once we actually moved here in june so uh now it's starting to get into the local scene there's putting leagues there's winter series coming up there's all sorts of things so you know i don't get to play a lot of disc golf even though i've been going to frisbee since i was eight you know i'm 42 now so it's been a while i've you know been playing disc golf since 2012 um and and i love disc golf but you know you don't get to play as much disc golf as i'm sure you both i know but both of you know this very well you don't get to play as much disc golf the more you work in disc golf so i'm excited to be here and and get in with the active scene, the local scene. I'm going out on Friday, this Friday, to help um, the Boise State University disc golf team uh, to speak to the to the crew there. Uh, they're getting ready to go down and play in the, the qualifier for nationals. And so they asked if I could come, and I'm excited to go down there. Tomorrow I'm going to go play catch. Uh, I posted on our local Facebook group. Uh, disc golf Facebook group. Hey, who wants to play catch? I've got some McConnies and some, you know, uh, Condors and some Zephyrs and stuff. And I'm like, this is a good old fashioned game of catch. So I'm excited to, to, to put some Frisbees in the air again. Uh, and, uh, and it's going to be fun. I thought maybe you just didn't have a basket. So you were hoping to find somebody that could throw <laughs> something to throw back to him. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I don't have a basket <laughs> anymore. So uh, yes. Yes. What, <laughs> one of the questions that's come in and, and this kind of a, has stretched out now or has come to fruition is maybe is a better way to word it this year there was not only a, a few events trimmed back and we're seeing now the silver the, you know no silver events here which of with them not being really offered then clearly there's a, even less of an obligation to be there and we saw the tour compact in some ways so where are we with 
trying to have a balance of how much is too much and how should golfers look to their schedule and when they should take off or can they take off? Like what are some of the, you know, even high level conversations or concepts that you talk about with our players? Cause I know things like pitch count when you've talked about, you know, some analogies and throw counts, you know, comes to mind, but what are some of the conversations you have with people who are saying, Hey, you know, there's, you know, volume, like you called it. What, what do you, what do you talk about? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, working, you know, in conversation with players, yeah, we talk about pitch counts. We've talked about, you know, I've talked about it for a long time with them of like, how can you make sure that you're, uh, that you're putting time in to active recovery, to rest, and you're being more intentional about the work that you're doing beforehand, uh, not just in like strength and conditioning and athletic preparation, but also in like your intentional field work practice, your intentional uh, you know, practice rounds. Um, I think, you know, there was a phase, there was, there was a period, uh, of what I would see out on the course, uh, back in, you know, I've only, I started disc golf strong in 2016. So it's not, it's been a couple of years, but as you know, I didn't know what they were doing as far as preparation, you know, back in the day, you know, back when Terry was in, mm-hmm. in his prime. Um, and so we would, I would see players where there wasn't a huge focus on playing all throughout the week. And now there's a huge focus on playing throughout the week. I mean, it's just, you know, money's getting bigger. Like everything's just, there's just so much, it's always been important, but now it's it's important or right. So um, they are putting more effort uh, into their practice where it was then for a period, it was like seven days a week of throwing. Like it was every single day, and it was, okay, I'm going to go out and do, I'm going to practice, I'm going to do a practice round and I'm going to throw four to five off the tee at every mm-hmm. tee pad, right? And then every approach, four to five and then four to five putts. And then I'm going to probably go back and play another round later in the day after lunch. And that volume just, I mean, it just stacks up so, mm-hmm. so quickly, right? And I, you know, I, I would tell them like I, I use a lot of baseball analogies, a lot, of, especially a lot of baseball pitcher, because it's it is closely related to what we're doing, just as much as like volume and intensity and everything, you know, velocity on the arm and and all the torque and stuff. And so, like a a starting pitcher, the muscles that are used in the fashion and the way that they're used uh, and engaged on the, a pitcher's first pitch and their 30th pitch and their 50th pitch and their 60th pitch. Like it's different because things are going to fatigue. And as the small muscles fatigue, it now requires like different activation of different muscles. And and so compensation is just going to naturally happen. So when a, when somebody's going out there and just putting a lot of reps in, you're not getting a a lot of high quality reps in. you're getting a lot of reps under extreme fatigue. Even if mentally you feel okay, those small muscles are going to get fatigued. Those, you know, and so uh, you're not going to get quality practice. And so we're now seeing in more and more players starting to take, like, say, Thursday off. And they're being more intentional about their practice, where I would tell, you know, I tell, you know, in, in conversation I have with players is you got to be very intentional out there on the course in the work that you're doing. Like, you know, I, there's players I've seen that they've been doing it for a long time where they'll go out and they'll only throw one or two off the tee, the ones that they are going to throw, not just throw to throw to throw, you know, uh, Hey, I feel like I got to throw four or five. I would never throw these three, but I'm just, you know, feel like throwing them. I feel like getting more volume off the tee. Like now be very intentional about mm. that. And it's something I talk about on the amateur side as well, which is players is like, understand what you're, AOS is and your AOIs are. Your AOSs are your areas of strength and your AOIs are your areas of improvement. And so they're not weaknesses because you can always get better at them with deliberate intentional practice. Um, but if you really understand what your AOSs are and your AOIs, not in just your own game, but as they pertain to that course, now your field work's going to be more intentional your work out on the course is going to be more intentional because now it's not just a volume to get better game, 
right? More is not just, more is not better. More is just more in a lot of cases, right? And so it's, okay, like the, the, uh, the Packers, when they're playing the Vikings, right, they're practicing throughout the whole week not to just play football for football's sake mm. because they're football players. They're practicing to play against the Vikings, to beat the Vikings, right? I mean, would you say, right? So well, maybe uh, last week they didn't. <laughs> they didn't practice yeah, that yeah, way, yeah, but right. they're trying to. You're right. <laughs> but they're intentional. They're looking. Yeah. The coaches are saying, what are, er- what are our areas of strength as it relates to the Vikings? What are our areas of improvement as it relates to their strength? Right on all mm-hmm. aspects of the of the game, and so what are we doing this week to get better against the skills that their quarterback has, mm-hmm. the skills that their cornerback has, right? And so the more intentional that we can get a, with that is, we look at a course and go, okay, what I'm playing Deglo, or I'm playing my local home course, like what are my areas of strength in my own game? And how does that relate to the tournament that I'm going to play coming up? Hopefully it's not just this weekend. You start thinking about that two, three weeks ahead of time. What are my areas of improvement that I need to work on? So let's say, okay, I'm playing a course where I know from past experience or watching coverage or whatever that I'm, I'm probably going to need some standstill forehand up shots 200 feet and in. And maybe I just go, you know what, I'm not really good at that. That's an area of improvement that I need to work on. So is my field work just me going out and emptying my bag? Or is my field work going, okay, in a one-hour session, 20% I'm sharpening my sword, my AOS is. The rest of the time, the 80%, I'm working my AOIs. I'm going to work on my standstill forehands. I'm going to pick out those specific discs as I think about the course, just like a football player, football team is thinking about how are we going to go against that quarterback or how are we going to stop that running back? What specific plays are we going to work on and drill this week that we didn't last week because they didn't have a running game last week. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, if I can get 10% better because I'm working on my AOIs on my forehand approach shot, like 10% bet. That's, that's more confidence that I'm going to have. Now, since I'm intentional about that, what goes down hopefully naturally my volume, yeah, right? Because I'm not sitting there just throwing for, for, for throwing sake. I'm actually going, okay, I'm going to be very intentional about those AOIs. And so I get more rest period. I'm not sitting there going, man, I just need to throw to throw to throw to throw. And the more I throw, the better I'm going to get. No, it's like, I'm going to be very intentional about what I'm doing as it relates to the tournament that I'm about to play. Confidence goes up, volume goes down intensity goes down recovery time goes up because now you don't have to sit there and feel like you're playing four practice rounds so that's some of the you know some of the concepts and the the the, the thought process behind how we can start to lower the volume while still the season is the season whether you're a pro or an amateur you're going to sign up for the things that you're going to sign up for or you have to sign up for because you're a pro and so it's a how do i manage that other stuff and by doing that, being more intentional about your things like your 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 work, your volume's gonna get better. Now, I, I know this is gonna ultimately come down to truly every individual, but just very generically speaking, when I tell you there's eighteen elite events, and then we're gonna have at least four majors, maybe one or two uh exhibition type uh, events as well, whether that's an all-stars or a, a funky farms doubles or skins or, or, or whatever we've had. So 18 and four, that's 22, add two more, uh, you know, you're talking at least 24 probably. And that's with no fun a tiers in your home state. That's with, with, you know, no other, you know, B tier that you've played the last nine years in a row and you want to make it the 10th. That's potentially 24 and international travel and countrywide travel, just just at face value, when I tell you 24 weekends of three to four to five rounds, usually three or four, how does that number strike you when, when I say that? That's, that's our tour season in a nutshell, 20 
24 events averaging three and a half rounds. Mm-hmm. How does that volume, yeah. should people be taking off? Like when you just hear that math, do you think, yep, yeah, you sh- every player should probably take at least two weekends off or is there a number? Yeah, I mean, I, I players should be looking at their schedule and looking at their volume and saying like where – where what events should I, am I going to prioritize and what events should maybe it's an event that doesn't necessarily suit your game and so you're like that's the event I'm going to take off you know give me some recovery there uh, I think you know at the pro tour we've always wanted to you know make sure that you know while it's a sport and while you're going out there and high volume is a thing whether it's in soccer or football or you know, um, baseball or whatever sport it is, volume and is going to be high intensity is going to be high, but how can, you know, we best support you through that. That's where I try to really do that at the athletic performance zone on site. Um, but you know, I always encourage, I've, I've had conversations with players where they're like, Hey man, I'm just I'm really feeling, you know, fatigued here. You know, how does, how does, what is, what does the upcoming schedule look like for you? And is there a way that you can, and work it to give yourself that break. And, you know, it's, a, it's always going to be an ongoing conversation. Um, I know Jeff, uh, you know, spring is always, you know, definitely player focused on wanting to, to always look at, okay, what are some ways that we can, you know, um, provide those, those weeks of rest while also having the season, there's a delicate balance there, you know, and, and that you're, you're always trying to, evolve too and you know we're we're always going to evolve um but the players have to definitely prioritize the volume that they're having that they're putting on their bodies um a a lot of it is going to be just you have to you have to have the volume and so that's that's also in the preparation too is just making sure that your bodies are excuse me that your bodies are able to should have all those uh, Reese's <laughs> peanut butter cups. <laughs> um, <laughs> the that your bodies are always, uh, you know, trying to you're tr- you're trying to get your body to a point where it can handle uh, as much stress and load and have a higher tolerance level for sure. Um, but I think we're we're getting better. Uh, players are getting better. They're thinking more about the stuff that you know just wasn't prevalent in our in our sport back in the day. The recovery and the preparation and the volume control and all that. And so uh, there's a, a lot of bright things ahead um, for sure. And I think we're going to look back, assuming that the sport continues to progress, I think we're going to look back in 10, 15 years and and be a little shocked at how much players play. And I think there's going to be more pro tour events. And I think there's going to be more players taking weeks off because assume mm-hmm. we have 30, 30 events in a year, a player is going to play 15 to 20 of those and take the rest off because they'll be able to afford to now, ass- assuming that the progression goes the way it is now. And, and, mm-hmm. our, and as you know, you've heard me say a lot of times our courses are just getting longer. Players are just throwing harder. It, it's a different sport than it was for us 20 years ago when the average, when the average hole length was 300 to 350 feet, you know, and, and we mm-hmm. were, you know, we threw through, you know, woods. There wasn't a lot of open shots. It was more wooded golf. Now we're seeing more spectator friendly courses, which means longer holes, more open, harder throwing. You know, the players are putting more strain mm-hmm. on their body than they than we were twenty years ago. Even if we played as much, the 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 forces at which we played were not nearly the level of what they're doing today. So hopefully, like I said, the Pro Tour continues to expand and gives the players the opportunity to say, I don't need to play all twenty five events. I can play twelve to fifteen make the pro tour finale, make myself a decent living and not have to, you know, grind away and, and be constantly putting the strain on my body. But we won't know. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a reason why like the, you know, consecutive innings pitched and the consecutive games pitched records and stuff in baseball are never going to be broken <laughs> because there was a point in baseball where it was like, you know, you're, when you were the starting pitcher, you're like, I'm going in there all the time. And I'm, you know, consecutive, like without, like, there's just, there was so much volume in baseball back in the day. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and in a lot of sports there was, and just as we evolve, uh, everything's just going to 
start to to level out a little bit in volume and the, the rest periods for players and stuff is going to definitely evolve as well. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, like looking back at some of the baseball players of you know even before you know we were into it, hearing about them pitch like yeah, your starting pitcher pitched three games of a seven game series. And that's what he did. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and and it's like, oh yeah, no, there was no reason why Nolan Ryan wasn't putting up 130 pitches in a game. Like, yeah, no, he he pitched 130. Well, it wouldn't have been 130 pitch no hitter, but you know, he his his mm-hmm, pitch count mm-hmm. was up into the hundreds regularly, and it was you know it, mm-hmm. it was it was different. The players even then, you know, the players are throwing harder now than they were even in baseball than they were then. But it, it was a it was a different it's a different mentality that we obviously know much more about what uh h- how to keep the players healthy um in, in all sports in general they just don't make them like they used to that's what i <laughs> say you bunch of bunch it, of sissies around here now <laughs> it's you know it, it and it's it's great that we're in a period of time where um you know these common conversations are happening not not just in disc golf but in sports in general i mean you know it was not that long ago where that kind of volume was happening regularly and it still happens mm-hmm. in other sports you know, so to to get where we're at, I mean, you know, I'm a professional strength and conditioning coach working in the sport of disc golf. I mean, you know, it probably took 150 years before there was a professional golf fitness coach, you know, like for the sport, you know, like it. <clears throat> so we're we're evolving, you know, very quickly when it as it relates to other sports. It wasn't that long ago that Wayne Gretzky said, you know, when a goal sc- when a weight scores a goal, I'll lift a weight. You know, like that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> And now we have, you know, full on professional strength coaches and all that in, in NHL as we've had for, you know, for many, many years now. But uh, that's not far removed from, you know, that that mindset in even hockey where it's like we don't need to do anything like you know, we're just playing hockey. Now, some some people and, and as we start to wrap up, I, I, I feel like. Obviously, you said you came in in 2016. I saw you out there, you know, offering up your services and your insight and your and all this knowledge and everything else that was benefit all to the benefit of our players. And then it what it didn't take long, really, before everyone else recognized uh, from up above, you know, both individual events and then eventually the tour to have you as a tool and an asset and a resource to all of our players, which is nothing but, you know, the highest of compliments to your work ethic and, and then your knowledge and and the value that you bring. I guess my question though, though, is, is, do you feel like pretty much everyone's on board and you don't have to call it names if they're not, but you used to get a handful of players that would maybe uh, out of either being timid or a disbelief, or a uh, or a non-belief, maybe would would possibly talk to you or work with you at first, just because you were new. Mm-hmm. Now, do you feel like just about everybody, you know, not only feels comfortable, but recognizes and appreciates and sees the value in which you, you and your resources and your team can bring to to keeping our players going? Yeah, I would say, you know, one of one of the things I understood when I when I first started uh, working in the sport was that and it was a goal of mine was to really start to change the culture and conversation around, you know, athletic performance and um, taking care of your body and thinking about the stuff off the course and how it can affect you in a positive way. Um, And so it was a culture that needed to shift. Um, like I said, they just, they didn't do it in, you know, football or hockey until they did, uh, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and, and that's a culture and a, and a conversation that still is evolving. It's still evolving. Like, you know, there's, uh, there's definitely going to be players that they just didn't grow up doing anything like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, no one, no one around them, you know, did it. And so to them, it just feels awkward to warm up at all, you know, Mm -hmm. just because that's just not, it it wasn't part of the culture. Like you're not going to get anyone in baseball in the major league baseball or anyone in the NFL or other sports uh, for that matter that got to the major league baseball and and the NFL and be like, like never did any strength conditioning whatsoever to get to this point. I mean, they, they, 
they do they do it in high school. They do it in elementary school now. I mean, they're doing it in you know if you're getting if you're on the path to football or you're on the path to baseball or soccer or cross country yeah, these days, like you're doing stuff. It's just natural. It's something that everyone around you is doing. And so why wouldn't you do it? And you see the value in it. And so do we have people, are there just, are there people that I won't, I won't even say they don't see the value in it. They can, you can see that there's something valuable. It's just, eh, maybe that's not for me. Sure. Or, or it's foreign to them. That's a, yeah. And, and, and I tell, and I tell players, like I'll have players sometimes like they, you know, they, uh, they get off their training program and, you know, then they're nervous to tell me and I'm like, Hey, like life happens. Like, that's okay. Like I'm, I'm not here to judge anyone. Like any player that doesn't come over to do a warm up with me or talk about anything. Like I have no judgment. I'm not like, it's like, I understand that we're still evolving. Like I said, you know, like doing this in disc golf, we don't, there's not a position for, you know, my position in a lot of sports at the level of sport that we are, you know? And so uh, it's going to just take time. It's going to take the youth doing it and it just be something natural, you know, to do. When I was, I remember being over in um, uh, Europe in 2019 and I was over there and, and taught clinics in five different countries there and, and it was just interesting to see one, I would get a lot more people that would show up to the clinics because, you know, they're, they, they see what the pros do and they tend to want to do more of what the pros do. So they would see Ricky or or someone working with me. But I remember doing a clinic with uh, Oakley in Sweden and there was a good, good crowd there. And so I, I said, who here plays uh, football? Uh, or hockey or some other sport and everyone raised their hand and i said who here warms up before they play football or hockey or your sport everyone raised their hand i said who here warms up before they play disc golf and no one raised their hand and we all laughed and stuff and i said so if this all of a sudden became like a hockey clinic and i said you know let's warm up you guys be putting your arms out and <laughs> getting mm -hmm. space and you know and everything but because it's a disc golf clinic now they were there to to have to see me and or to, to listen to what I had to say, so you know I had a captive audience, but uh, you know just in general they still they they were like no like it was foreign to them. Now they wanted to come and see about it, but still it was a foreign concept to them. And that wasn't long. That was 2019, right? And so I understand that it's that it's evolving. We look at sports like you know like I said I, I've already said it's like we look at the PGA. We look at we're like oh man. What are they doing? It's like they took a hundred something years to get to where they're at, right? So we're 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 moving fast. We're moving fast in many areas, but uh, yeah, we're gonna get players that for a while are still going to be timid. And I've got players that come warm up every single time. They don't miss it, you know. I'll call out some names: Ricky Wysocki, you know, uh, Corey Ellis is over there every single time. I even get Paul Ulibarri, right? He, he comes over there, right? And, uh, and he's so, old. Uh, he, he yeah, needs, right. <laughs> he needs some help. He's old now. <laughs> you know, you know, Yuli will, will Yuli will come over. You know, um, there's a, there's a lot of players, uh, both on the MPO and FPO side, that come over every single time. Sarah Hokum, Madison Walker, others. But um, and then there's some players that they don't come over unless they feel something and they're like, mm -hmm. hey, my shoulders, my shoulders bother me right now. So they trust maybe maybe a warm up is just not something that. They want to introduce into their routine right now. It's because they don't know how it's going to affect their game, whatever is their reasoning. But when they're hurting, they like, Seth, I need you right now. You know, should I go out today? Should I throw? What are we doing? Right. And, and so, and that's okay. And I, and I want to make sure that I have space for them. And then at some point I've had people where they're they experience an injury or they, something's going on. And then after that, they start coming warm enough every single time, you know, because now like, the ice was broken. Yeah, and and to be fair, some of those, almost every one of those players, even if they're not necessarily 
warming up with you and at your stations, they're probably doing some form of their own warm up, of course. Some stretching, I mean, maybe at, some short to some degree, back and, it, forth. and it might be the routine they've been in for two or four or ten years, and they're going to mm-hmm. keep doing what works for them. And and that's obviously no disrespect to you or your program. It's just that's nope. you know what they want to keep doing, um, which I can totally yep. understand as well. But it just feels <clears throat> yeah, like had- that comfort level is getting wider and bigger and your your group and your session or not your sessions but just the the crowd around you and the players uh in the station it just it feels like it grows every year which to me seems obvious uh that it would but it, it's been awesome to see yeah it's been growing all the time i mean we're <clears throat> we're always getting more people coming over all the time and i said <clears throat> they may not come over every time because there there are some periods where it's like somebody who comes over all the time but uh they got stuck in traffic or something happened. They got 10, 20 minutes before they tee off or they just really feel like they need to get that putter hot. Mm-hmm. And so I, I don't, if they walk right past and say, Hey, what's up? You know, and they walk off and go putting. I'm not like, you know, wow, good luck sucker. Like, good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, you like should have stopped that, here. <laughs> <laughs> if that's what they feel is going to be best for them that day. You know, we, at the ducks, we had a, a, a great hockey player named Timmy Solani. And uh, and Tamu finished Flash Hall of Famer, and my strength coach there, uh, who was the strength coach for the Minnesota Wild for a long time after after leaving the Ducks, um, he great strength coach. Tamu, Tamu did really nothing that uh, you know we had planned on the board. Uh, he would come in. I would have I would put two forty fives on each side on a barbell. He would come in. He put it on his back. He would do like. 20 or 30 just like quarter squats just little squats boom done done totally not in line with the philosophy (laughs) that we had or anything that's tamu solani he's been doing that for like 35 40 years right like (laughs) we were like hey great job tamu you want to you know here's your smoothie like you know that would make fun it's like (laughs) that was one of the most stressful parts of my job was making smoothies because you had to have them done I've ever watched hockey before, but things can change in seconds, right? <laughs> and so when you got to have the smoothies prepared, fresh, and ready to go, like the Damn. the the protein shakes uh-huh. for the whole team, and like my job, one of my jobs was to have the protein shakes ready, right? And you know the ducks are down by like one, or they're ahead by one with like ten seconds to go, and I'm back there making the protein shakes, get them all <laughs> pouring, and then all of a sudden there's like two seconds left, bam going to overtime i'm like great now all these <laughs> now all these protein shakes are gonna be ruined now i gotta go and i gotta figure out how to and to oh. see the guys that were like health like the guys that were healthy scratches uh you know they would like they would just be sitting there like because i was making it like in the same area that they were just like hanging on the couch watching the game and they're just laughing at me just razzing me the whole time <laughs> as i'm trying to make these shakes for everyone but basically but essentially so there are players that have come in and they have their own thing that really works well for them. And Mm -hmm. I don't take any offense to that because I'm like, if that is working for you, awesome. And when, when you feel like there's at some point you want something from how I can help as well to either revamp what you're doing or, you know, just give some pointers and, and kind of tweak what you're doing. That's okay. Like I don't, I don't have an ego as a coach where I'm like what I'm doing is what everyone absolutely has to be doing because if what worked for Tamu Solani is the finish flash, right? If I give him some exercise and he feels like a tenth of a second slower, <laughs> you know, now like that's that's not good for us, you know. Like he, we want him to feel confident, and I want the same thing for the players on tour to feel confident with what they're doing, and that's 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 the goal. I don't believe you. I think at the end of every round. You go out to UDISC, you hit the sort button to get the worst scores up at the top, and then you just go through with a little uh, list and you just check off, oh, worked out with me, eh, didn't work out with me. And you sit and you go by yeah, who yeah. shot the worst scores. Like mm, yeah. In a condescending tone, you're like, hmm, oh, hmm. Mm-hmm. And you're just looking at all the at mm-hmm. the scores. No? Okay. Mm-hmm. That was full. All right. No, I, had, I, had, uh, I had some, at one point, I did like, Back before I really worked for the tour, I had favorited some players on UDISC, just some players that I was working with often just to keep an eye right on them. And then one time I just, I just had them favorited. Like I didn't, 
you know, and Uh-oh. I was sitting there with another player and they're like, they're like, Oh, what's going on with you disc? And I like pull up you disc and he's like, he's like looking at you disc with me. And he's like, I'm not a favorite. I'm like, Oh man, I didn't like it. Ouch. <laughs> like I need to get rid of this favorite list because I get players all the time. Like that are like, Hey, you know, like what's going on? And we're like looking at the scores or over there. I keep it very light. Oh, I keep it very light over. It's opening up have, incognito like, windows. You know? Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Know. Yeah, let, let me log into like, Tiffany's U disk, and uh, yeah. she's yeah. She's... So, <laughs> so one uh, yeah, one last exactly. question. We'll talk to you uh, this week. Eagle yep. McMahon, as much as you can talk about, uh, had his shoulder uh, surgery for his labrum. Very mm, labrum, lab- yeah. Labrum. Obviously, what obviously, else would it be? <laughs> not the other word that you used a couple weeks ago. Um, and what what can you tell us about Eagle's uh, surgery and his his recovery? He, I believe, he said that he's looking at a. Uh, probably a four month recovery, but he might push it out to six and hopefully be back sometime early, you know, whether that's, you know, May, May Mayish, if he's lucky. Uh, What what, what do you know? Have you heard from him? I think he mentioned he talked to you at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I talked to, yeah, I've talked to Eagle and, you know, before the surgery, after the surgery and, you know, he's in good spirits and definitely looking forward to a, a, a good recovery period. Uh, one thing I'll say about Eagle is, you know, I've been working with him for many years now, and and he, he's someone that you tell him, you know, you give him advice on, say, hey, I want you to to do this or look into this. He's going to do it. Uh, you know, he's he's going to. He's he's not only an amazing athlete, but he's an amazing professional athlete who takes takes what he what what the gifts and the skills and everything that's been bestowed upon him and all the hard work, he, he doesn't take it for granted and he wants to do everything he can to be the best athlete he can be. And so, um, you know, with his, when it was time, when it was time to, to go the route of surgery, it, it wasn't a decision I know that he takes lightly. Um, and I, I've always with, with Eagle, as I do with others, like, you know, I, I'm not there with Eagle um, in in Colorado with him. And it would be a disservice to him for me to say, like, just listen to me. I'm going to do all your recovery. I'm going to do everything. Because that requires, like, a lot of, like, in-person, you know, what's going on today. So I'm like, hey, what, you know, we've, for years now, it's like, hey, what coach can we get you? You know, he's got a coach there as well that he's working with. So I'm working with them in the sense that, you know, right now more of a, just a, a guidance and advisory, just someone to talk to, because I want that. I want that coach and that, that team on, on the ground with him to be able to look, how is it doing today? Like it's, it's hard to do that with anyone over video and then give them the great, the, the, the good advice. So, so he's, he's always been someone that takes it, like I said, very uh, um, uh, to heart and and to soul and to everything he wants to do. So, one thing we talked about in a text message was, uh, uh, is that you know I said I know you're gonna recover, you're gonna rehab like it's your job, and he said that too. We've been you know we've said that in the past over other things is like rehab like it's your job, and I said I know that everything that you're tasked to do and you're told to do you're gonna do, and that's all you can do. Like. The, the recovery is going to, as long as you put in the work and you put in educated work and you have good guidance and you, and you follow a plan and you're, and you're consistent, we don't know what the, end, recover, what the end, end result of anything is going to be. But if you put in good stuff, there's a lot better chance of good stuff happening at the end, right? And Eagle's going to put in good stuff. Eagle's going to make sure that he's at the top of his game before he comes back. He's going to make sure that, you know, he's able to do the things he needs to do. Um, and he's, he's always been that way since I've been working with him. It's, you know, it's a, truly an honor and, and to have been working with him over these years through this because he'll do it. He'll do it. You tell him to do anything, he'll do it. Yeah, I think he had said that it's, it's going to be about uh, one month of recovery, uh, like full recovery, not moving, not throwing, not doing anything, just, just, just literally healing. And then f- like six to eight weeks of uh, physical therapy is, you know, the next step mm-hmm. after that. And yeah, I think he said then after that is when he'll probably look at picking up a disc and starting to casually throw mm-hmm. it. So it won't be 
for literally three more months before he probably even touches a disc. Or even then he said mm-hmm. it will just be the lightest of of maybe putting or throwing before anything. I think he said it's going to probably be four to five months before he's really throwing again. So because they, mm-hmm. they had said it was going to be yeah. four, four to six month recovery time. And he said he has no, thankfully with the, with the backloaded season of majors next year, he doesn't have to really rush because the first, the first <clears throat> huge event for him is probably going to be the European open. And, and so mm-hmm. that gives him until July to really, recover there's no there's no hurry there's no nothing that he can just relax and 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 not really worry too much about missing anything which you know on a whole nother note sounds to me like a guy who really isn't thinking about uh switching up sponsors <laughs> it sounds like it, to me i think he's kind of got I, I i i think that's a i think it's a guy who's comfortable mm-hmm <laughs> okay, on that note, uh, Seth, we uh, we do really appreciate you joining us and, and providing some backstory, some insight, um, just some of the philosophy that I think so many people, for you know, maybe old school or even new school, just don't necessarily all put the pieces together. And you've been doing that for the pro tour, for the players, uh, and for people on a personal level with within your training and and whatnot. So, thank you for doing all of that. Can you point someone toward some resources, you know, that that you're offering or that others are offering that you feel comfortable recommending? Uh, anywhere you can point people uh, that might be looking to get uh, have their off season routine and or some just a coaching or direction. Where can you? Where can? Where should they go? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, discgolfstrong.com is is a place where we're, you know, we put out stuff and, and on my social media, I'm going to be putting out a lot more content um, now that the season is over and I've got mm-hmm. more time uh, to, to do that. So just helpful things that, you know, you can do. Um, we have a we have a free pre round warm up ebook. There's no strings attached to it or anything. It's just because we want like a, we want people to just warm up. And if that's one piece of advice for everyone is, you know, if you just start with a warm up, a good warm up, you can not only impact the ability of your of your body to perform better the, the way you want it to, um, but also become more resilient against injuries, lower that injury risk. And so, uh, you know, definitely start doing a warm up, whether it's something I do or something you do on your own. You know, um, go down that path. Um, and just I, I encourage people to start where you are, do what you can. You know, one of the biggest blocks for as we talked about in the beginning with nutrition and stuff I and mean, biggest blocks is people think you got to go crazy if you want to make some improvements people think you got to do it all some you know you got to get do the highest volume and the highest intensity the most complex stuff just do something this off season um and you know you're gonna you're gonna be better for it but if you go to discgolfstrong.com you'll see there's some some more guidance there um yeah awesome Awesome. Well, you've clearly been a resource for me on a personal level in many ways. Also, every weekend when we're checking in, whether it's the you know the weather and or conditions and things going on the ground, we really appreciate. It. And as you said, all the extra work and things you've been tasked with uh, it, to to watch your roles transition and really just get piled on more. I hope they keep paying. <laughs> I hope the paycheck piles on more. Uh, all the things, the safety and the the weather and the things that are included there along along with all of, uh, the, the training and strength and conditioning with our players. It's been an incredible journey to see you on, and we, uh, we appreciate you joining us tonight, and we appreciate all the insight for everyone else out there. Yeah. Uh, Disc Golf Strong is what they should check out. Any other plugs or resources that uh, uh, they need to look at or, or you could point them to or reference points that you often use? Maybe any books? I know you often speak of meditation and some apps and programs there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say uh, sure. Um, I would say Mind Gym and Athlete's Guide to Inner Excellence is a great book. I've, I've recommended it to many, to many uh, players. Um, and so doing some mental game, some mental skills training for sure. Uh, doing some meditation. Uh, it, it can go such a long way. Even five minutes, it feels like nothing. But uh, if you ask Eagle, he's going to highly recommend it. Um, so the, the meditation, uh, just... Yeah, that's where I would say. I mean, okay. Smashbox, I've heard that's a great podcast, so definitely check them out. <laughs> yeah, um, if you need a nap. Or a long, that's right. For, <laughs> no, for, for those no, long no. drives, it makes your long drives feel a lot shorter. <laughs> uh, 
No, well, I appreciate you both. It's it's always been an uh, honor and pleasure to be, you know, guest with you here and also just, you know, seeing you in person. I, mean, I got to see you at USCGC. It was one of the happiest times uh, that I've had because I haven't seen you in person in a while. And so yeah. I loved, loved seeing you there. So thank you both. Uh, I look forward to continuing to chat with you here in person on the phone, whatever we do. And thanks to everyone at home for, for tuning in. Uh, not only me, but to listen to these guys all the time because, you know, you guys bring so much value to our sport and you have for so long. So appreciate you all. And as I always say, you know, train disc golf strong because you got to be able to play disc golf strong. Right. Appreciate you, buddy, everyone. That's Seth Muncy wearing uh, yes. a dozen different hats, eating a dozen or more Reese's peanut butter cups, sure. but we're not judging. We love more, you, buddy. More. Thanks for joining us and all having right. a good night. Love you too, guys. See ya. Good night, Seth. All right. All righty. What a good guy. It was I mean, nice to be able to see him right. at USDGC. Had a great hug from him. Gave a great hug to him. Mm. Just in general. Just a, a good a good resource. I, I was thinking back to... Um, it was probably 2018 or 2019 when uh, we for, when he first came on the show. No, we had him in 2017. Was it 2017? I couldn't, I couldn't remember. Exactly. Uh, I, we might have had him before that, but 2017 world specifically uh, in, a, in a bar in, in Augusta during the worlds when we had one of our nightly podcasts, oh, yeah. we also had him as an on-site guest. That's right. And uh, that was when we were all together doing it yeah. uh, there specifically. Well, I have a Disc Golf Strong uh, a uh, little towel it's just hanging out. It just sits there. It's kind of just a little, like a... A, a classic a reminder. It's a reminder, a memento. Well, we appreciate, uh, again, everything that Seth has been doing. And, and I, I, I mean that so sincerely when I talk about mm -hmm. watching his yeah. roles expand in really all the, the stress and pressure and, and additional work that's been put on his shoulders. Uh, just uh, so valuable. So we, we love you and appreciate you, Seth. Yeah, I thought it was a good idea to talk to talk with him about Eagle because Eagle had made a big, long Instagram post about his recovery. Uh, it was him and a Pokemon Snorlax just chilling out on a couch. Yeah. And that's... just kind of talking about what he's looking at for the next, you know, four to six months. So it was, it's good to get Seth's input on that as well. Yeah, it was, uh, again, the 25th or 26th where I believe Eagle had his surgery. And somebody had asked me this weekend uh, if I had seen the video he posted. So you must maybe took in more than I did. Uh, but it's I think he had a video just prior to surgery and then one right after yeah, surgery. Yeah, I saw the one so. right after surgery. Okay, so it, make sure you guys check it out if you want to. five six minutes long where he just talks about, you know, what's coming up for him. Yeah, if you want to hear it from Eagle, find him on, on the Instagrams. and Yeah, uh, I think that's about all that we have for our regular show. It's, it's all... I've got a lot of random other places to go with it, but uh, sure. we've got we more for the, the after, after show. show. So uh, with that, I think we're going to call it for our regular show tonight. Stick around the after show. As always, we'll talk disc golf. We'll talk things non-disc golf. we got a few exciting things that are going to be coming up in the next week or so that I want to get a little bit more into kind of sort of just maybe a longer tease uh but most importantly a tease giveaway the tease a giveaway we're gonna have a giveaway and if you want to be eligible for that giveaway, how do you do Terry? that Johnny oh I was gonna I was gonna throw it at you but I will say uh I will tell everybody it is patreon.com slash smashbox tv um if you want to help us in any financial way, we'll put that right towards Disc Golf Strong. Yeah, Terry all we do I, is buy ice cream for that guy. Both, both you and I need Disc Golf Strong <laughs> in some matter. Yes. Um, so if, if you support us at patreon.com slash smashboxtv, it'll help us continue to put out this podcast for years to come. And you can win free stuff every single week. You could win something for free. Uh, yeah, you win, we give away a disc every single week. Or more. So make sure uh, you check that out. We're going to call it. That's po Smashbox TV's podcast 478. We're going to take a quick break. We'll stand down and then we'll see you in the after show. For Johnny, I'm the Disc Golf Guy. Thank you, Seth, for joining us. We'll see you in the after show. Again, Smashbox TV podcast 478. We'll see you when you step inside the Smashbox. 478. Thank you to our $2 and above patrons. Your name is listed below in the credits. If you are interested in being listed as a producer in the Smashbox TV credits and supporting this and other fine podcasts, please visit patreon.com slash smashbox TV.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smashbox TV's podcast, 478's After, After Show. What did you go to this Halloween for? What did you, what did you dress up as, Terry? So, uh, it, it, did, it did not make any postings, except for maybe one or two golfers I ran into uh, that have pictures. Uh, otherwise, I didn't publicly post that I was officially... <laughs> The disc golf guy Fieri when I was in Vegas this weekend. Mm. And I put a little effort into it. Did and you, did you frost the tips? Got, uh, got to frost the tips. No, I, I went a di oh, that's the one thing I'll change about the costume when it reemerges. And so this was a trial run. It'll reemerge. I don't know when, but at some point it will. And rather than going with a a silver like hair dye putty type well, I mean, product. I think, I think a wig is probably better. <laughs> well, rather than going with silver, which is kind of where his hair color is today, the problem yeah. is that's not synonymous with the Guy Fieri that everyone kind of instantly thinks about. It was definitely the frosted, frosted slash like straight up just like bleach blonde yellow hair Correct. is really is really the guy that everyone knows. However. Uh, a few things that I took away from being in Vegas on Halloween. Well, there's a lot, but uh, a couple of specific did, well, ones. Well, the question is, did you take away any money? <laughs> um, no, unfortunately, that was okay. not the case. Um, well, uh, I, I won. I won on the horses uh, playing. Horses. Nah, it's it's just a game that's uh, oh. on Fremont Street. <laughs> so I, I thought you were like, well, it was, betting it, on the ponies. No, nah, it, it 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 is one of I think only two or three. In the country, I looked it up a few years ago when I learned about this game. Um, there's only a couple that exist now that are left in the country, and it's one of the most fun games you could play down uh, at the D down in uh, on Fremont Street. Anyway, I won a few dollars there, but I lost on the blackjack table. Another story. Um, yeah, one of the big takeaways was that I just need to change up the hair color, but I was excited that there wasn't really a second guessing. Nobody came up to me. And like, guess the wrong person. Well, no, I think there's again knowing me. There's two famous celebrities you could always go as. Yes, Guy Fieri and Mark McGuire. If you want to oh. pick, if you want to pick one of no, two, there's a third then. Oh, that that God. I've I've been I've been almost mistaken for, and and I I wish I wish I had the physique to be more of a Mark McGuire, uh, which I I never have, but. Mm -hmm. Well, no, but you've got the you got the goatee, the reddish hair, yeah. like that. Uh, uh, you know, who's the third, Terry? Larry the Cable Guy. Now, now, is there something? Really? Is there something weird that Larry the Cable Guy, see, Guy see, Fieri, and the Disc Golf Guy? There, there's there's a bunch of guys. Yeah. Um, I I don't see you as yeah. A, I think a flannel, a cutoff flannel. Now, Guy Fieri sometimes goes with like a, a a plaid shirt that kind of became sometimes. sometimes. Yeah. Everyone knows him for like the, the flame the flames. shirt. And, but yeah. then also he was kind of a bowling shirt slash plaid shirt guy for a little while, mm -hmm. and then Larry the Cable Guy. Well, you just take that same plaid shirt, you cut off, you rip off the sleeves. I think you, you put the hat on with the fishing hook and that right there. That's some funny stuff. Yeah, like, but I, think, I feel like you could do that with almost any person. You put me in a, a flannel cut off with a, with yeah, a, with but like you a, don't have the hat. physique and uh, like, I don't have the goatee and the physique, but I still think that is like the cut off flannel and the hat really give it away for almost everybody. Now, not to say that you don't fit the, you, you <laughs> I, don't fit the bill. Unfortunately, I look I like him. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you there. I'm not, I'm not going to lie, Terry. But I feel it, it, if you're really looking, like without the shirt or the hat, I just don't see. Oh, see, I've been. I like, people have said you. You know, you look like Larry the Cable oh, Guy. Like uh, on a plane, I'll never forget. Uh, I was, see, I was I, on a plane, and somebody actually said that to me, and I wasn't wearing a yeah. a, uh, a hat with a fishing hook in it or no, any camouflage just, or or, I'm not or saying plaid. It's, it's it's unlikely that someone but i don't see it nearly as much as i do the other two as guy fieri or mark mcguire i think i look a lot more like larry the cable guy than mark mcguire oh, i don't think so i think i think facially <laughs> now, now again not physique facially. exactly i have some natural uh physique here that works for me when it comes to fieri or larry the cable guy yeah yeah you look like classic cardinals mark yeah. mcguire yeah that that i do yeah way back in his heyday not cool now, if this means I have to start doing steroids, 
Uh, HGH, my friend. Whatever. <laughs> Are we splitting hairs at that <laughs> yeah, point? Are yeah. we splitting red hairs at that <laughs> point? For crying out loud. Uh, so, anyway, it it was pretty well received, and the amount of people like Guy Fieri, and there there were a number of people just straight up strangers. It, it, they'd say that, no big deal. But a few people like would st- actually stopped me on Fremont Street and like, dude, that outfit is awesome. That looks great. Like I I was okay. I was uh, appreciative of the strangers' compliments. The other kind of unique thing that I was surprised about, I saw zero other Guy Fieri's. Like, and maybe it's just because the costume is quote unquote the costume now, did you go to, is played out a you, little bit. I was to say you were in Vegas. Did you go to the Guy Fieri restaurant? I walked past it a few nights. That's on the strip, yep. uh, right next as you're leaving um, the Link, which is one of my favorite hotels. That's when you leave the Link and you're heading over to uh, Harrah's. But um, I ate there. I ate there during the. Um, I've never been to Vegas. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. I ate there during the Las Vegas Challenge this year. Eh, not impressed. Like I, the the food was just okay. It was better than the time I had Guy Fieri's in New York in New York City a few years ago. So well, as everyone kind of says, I don't think you're going to Guy Fieri's for like the fine dining cuisine like it's it's i mean he's a chef you should be right yeah but (laughs) him more than say mark mcguire's steakhouse no which is funny i would completely think it's the other because i don't expect mark mcguire to be making me steak (laughs) so you assume his is going to be good i'm assuming he has a like not that the other guy doesn't have a professional chef but i think that the quality like a steakhouse i'm expecting a good steak when i go to guy fieri's i'm expecting like American food. I'm expecting a good like cheeseburger. Yeah, with but some something fries that he's some, some sauce. Like I don't expect again fine dining from. Well, no, I from wouldn't there. call it fine, but it it should be good should in be the fla- sense that it's his. It, well, it should be flavorful. That's what I would expect. More flavorful because he, you know, I had the chicken uh, when I was of there in, in uh in Mar or uh, February. Meh. Anyway, I, so I don't need to. I, I walked past it a couple times this weekend, and of course, I, I chuckled to myself. But so anyway, I, I haven't dressed up in a number of years. I hemmed and hawed about the idea. I almost showed up to the course in in said attire, uh, and then I uh, I'll, I don't I don't want to call it chickening out, but I ultimately didn't, and I, I reserved it for Fremont Street on Saturday night, and uh, in, in I will say it was a success. So now I have all oh, the good. basics. And uh, so I'll spoil it now that next time, if you ever see me in a costume, then the next attempt will be another Guy Fieri, the disc golf Guy Fieri, kind of like I, a Missy Gannon Burr thing, you know, where the yeah, name you can just... Only, you can only roll with that so much. True, I mean, true. Like, I at agree. At some point, you can't do it. Like, two years in a row? Sure. But Three, I'm saying golfers four. have never seen it No, go, you're right. So yeah. I, I did run into a couple yeah. golfers on the strip, uh, and a few pictures were taken, but I did a very poor job of otherwise docu- no, documenting it myself. So All right. anyway, that was uh, – did, did you did you um, dress up? Barely. Um, I have uh, – I went with – Don't tell me you were Larry the Cable Guy. <laughs> I was not Larry the Cable Guy. Uh, dark blue jeans, and I have an Ernie – I'm like Bert and Ernie sweater, the blue, red, yellow striped sweater, which is sits in my closet all year long because my daughter loves this is the second year in a row she wanted to go as rubber ducky. And so I just throw on the Ernie sweatshirt and walk around the neighborhood with her. And you know, it's and we, we get we do about maybe three or four blocks, which is about all she really wants to do before mm. she wants to go home. And get, she gets herself a little thing of candy. Unlike my son, who, you know, him and his buddies even though they're freshmen, I was trying to think of like, at what age did I stop trick or treating? And it must've been about 15, 15 ish to 16 where I, I stopped trick or treating, but cause he's, he's 14 and him and his buddies all went out and they, they ransacked the neighborhood. You know, they, they knew, they knew the houses from last year that gave out the full size candy bars. Okay. So they, they made sure to hit those right away. And, uh, but yeah, so I went as Ernie, my daughter went as rubber ducky and my son with his three, with two of his buddies, there's an old Monty Python skit about the Spanish inquisition. You never mm-hmm. expect the Spanish inquisition where they're all wearing red, uh, like frocks almost with a, my son had a big hat. There's one that has an aviator's cap and there's one that just kind of has a, a, a tighter red cap on him. Um, and again, I don't know where he picked it up from. It must have been something my, that my wife introduced him to, or something along those lines. Because it's a Monty Python skit from the from like the early '80s or late. 70s yeah, I was gonna say, what age do 
do others have to be to get that reference? Oh, I asked him. He said one person got it. One person in the in the entire walking around understood. The, wow! The, even the so the adults, all the other oh, adults no, in your area I, I didn't you, get it. I think you have to be like in your sixties, probably, okay. and understand Monty and and have been a fan of Monty Python. Okay, because okay. even our age, that was probably ten years before us. So probably, uh, okay. So probably mid fifty. So he said one person got it, and he didn't really care because he thought it was fun. It, him and his two buddies got to dress up as the Spanish Inquisition. Um, yeah, and, I and, I knew I wouldn't get it because that I, wasn't my thing. But I also wondered I was, how many yeah, others. No, even I wasn't a big Monty. I, okay. I, I love Monty Python movies from you know Holy Grail, Life of Brian, you know all those things. I I love the movies. I was never into the show, the TV show really, which is where this came from. Okay. So, well, so Tim that, Tim says he would have gotten it. Tim would have gotten it. And uh, just to wrap up. Yes, as Robert Kuhn says, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition, which is 100% what, uh, what it was. And they thought it was funny because no one would, as they said, no one would expect the Spanish Inquisition. Yeah, and I'm I like, mean, you're right. What no a one, clever play. No yeah. one would have picked, no one would have picked you. So. All right. Was, uh, just to, to also fully tie it up, it is called uh, Sigma Derby. And it says, uh, if you Google it quickly, when I was talking about that horse game, the, this 34-year-old game was a staple in most casinos and is a star attraction at the D. Currently, it's the only one remaining in the city. Sigma Derby is a beautifully crafted track game that includes five mechanical horses. All you have to do is bet on the horses that will finish in first and second. And you can play for as little, literally, as a quarter. Wow. Uh, and they give you different odds. And it's just a lot of fun. I've had a lot of hours spent watching this and it's a very low can be a very low budget uh form of entertainment when you're there so make sure you go check out the sigma game i think i looked it up a few years ago i'll end it there but it, i feel like there's only a few left in the world now after being uh, mm -hmm. such a popular game as it was oh. saying and it can only be found downtown and i guess i, I to follow up the halloween question your daughters uh, did they dress up were no they uh they uh funny i don't think i saw any pictures I know Kenzie went out. I don't think Allie went out um, to, to go. And uh, I don't know if I even really saw pictures of what they were. So it must not have been too, too extreme. Too extreme. Uh, I, I will say that uh, <laughs> uh, Mackenzie, my younger daughter, uh, managed to close down the final night of Six Flags Fright Fest last night. Oh, great. And believe it or not, well, tonight was supposed to be the night on Halloween. They were supposed to be open to like 10 or 11 tonight. It snowed in the uh, in the area, in Wisconsin at least. And so I believe they actually closed Six Flags and it wasn't open today. So I'm glad they did get to go last night. Uh, it was open to like 11 o'clock last night, which is crazy uh, that on a Monday night, that wasn't Halloween yet. It was still open till 11, but she managed to close it down last night. So uh, Kenzie so, getting full use of that, so she, that pass. She closed down Six Flags last night at 11 and still went to school this morning? Well, there, there, was, there was some flexibility there oh. that uh, her and some friends, some liberties taken. Wow. Uh, that's not my... I, I don't make all those parenting choices. No. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> let's, just, let's just go there. Let's leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. So... Uh, yes, that was that was all part of the ordeal. Uh, a couple other things I'll quickly make note of. Uh, I was asked, um, spoiler, I guess, uh, assuming it's happening, I was asked uh, today to be on uh, Tour Life podcast tomorrow evening. So if you're what, what? listening live, uh, I think I'm going to be a guest. Well, now, now, to be fair, I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't reached out to. I was asked by Paul uh, today, and uh, he said I would get some Dude. other information that hasn't come. So maybe, maybe uh, it's not finalized. But I believe that it is. <laughs> well, Brody's been on our board, so we'll. So maybe we'll, he'll we'll confirm. But do, uh, I do there... need to know some times because I actually have to run kids around to volleyball. So if somebody, Brody, if you could let me know I think it's... exactly like a time yeah. frame. Uh, just so I can plan my. Are you just going to be on? Do you know if you're just being on as a regular guest? I guess I. Are they looking for an expert on something? No, I. I was just asked like, if I'd be interested in joining, and okay. I blindly said yes to that. So if uh, that's about all that I know as of right now. Okay. Um, <laughs> he well, says you're Brody. Says you're good. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Just give me a rough estimation on the uh, time frame. A again, I have uh, oh, Brody twelve and fifteen year old kids to uh, to offer up rides to and that's the only reason why i so asked probably around 8 30 eastern. eastern so 7 30 central ish okay all right one way or another i'll make it all work not a problem 
Anyway, so uh, that will happen. And uh, a follow-up that's unrelated is last week I teased out that there'd be possibly a big special uh, conversation slash announcement tonight that's pushback. Um, so next week we're going to have a uh, a pretty exciting special announcement uh, that will be able to be discussed, but uh, with some things going on and everything else, we're going to push it back. Mm. So next week you're just going to have to tune in. I guess that's all I can oh, say to it. Big announcement. Special yeah. announcement. Special, big. Bigger for some than others. Uh, it, it's it's more satisfying for me and a few others than, I don't know. I guess it's exciting. but And Johnny doesn't even know what it is. I don't know. I'll ask him after the after And the uh, Yuli wanted to know what it was, too. I said, uh, you're, you're not going to find out because it doesn't get released till next week. So you, you nobody's going to find out. The, <laughs> there won't be any breaking news uh, tomorrow night on it either. I'll just, again, tease, ev- tease everybody. So there you have it. Um, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of 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 outside of play. Uh, as I said, I'm in the regular show, excited to be in Vegas for the beach here this weekend. That went really well. Congrats to the staff and the crew and everyone, the club, everyone that was able to pull it off. We saw a new tournament director. Uh, Sam had taken over. We've seen a couple different tournament directors are keeping uh, the blood fresh. Um, some other notes that I. I uh l- let's just say this because i i i don't know what i should or shouldn't share so i'll <laughs> kind of say uh the, I, here's what i can say for sure the las vegas challenge has requested two potential dates for next year and we all know that alternate when, dates one alternate date and then possibly keeping their oh, uh, their okay. original date so that's what i can share is they have requested an alternate date that is a few months later obviously than than their uh, originally slotted february time frame so um i i don't know when that gets officially decided it might be as early as tomorrow i think pdga is trying to lock in all the a tiers and i i it's not i i don't feel like it's my i didn't ask explicitly to share the alternate date that they requested but they have put in an alternate date that is later than the february 24th ish weekend and I think we'd probably find out here really soon as to if that will be uh, granted or not. But that is something that's pretty exciting. And I know there's just been a lot of conversation and hubbub, for lack of, excuse me, of a better term, when people were talking about what the schedule is going to look like for next year. Obviously, the Pro Tour with the All-Stars and then the first event of the year all starting out in Florida. And then would Vegas continue? What they did confirm, though, from the club and, and others, mm-hmm. big-time sponsors, Innova, yeah. obviously a huge sponsor, but other big time sponsors are on board. Wild Horse, you know, th- three or four days, whatever the case is, uh, looking for additional media coverage. Like they still want to go all out. And I think they're going to treat it just as if it were as big or bigger than ever, any other time. It's their 25th anniversary and they want it to be, you know, as big and special as possible. So that's what I can relay for now. And maybe I think maybe even as early as tomorrow, I think the PDGA might be talking eight tier schedules. I'll follow that up and say, maybe we'll have some more insight, but I believe tomorrow is a PDGA board of director fall summit that is also starting. And so we're excited that as that happens this week, Maybe as early as next week. The A-tier schedule will, will be released tomorrow, See? is what Carrie Neal is um, saying. Maybe as early as next week, too, we'll have some other conversation pieces and maybe even some PDGA representation that can Ooh. talk to us regarding the board and the summit that they're having. So I, I did reach out to the PDGA just today, and I said, hey, if there's anyone, you know, either a contractor or a board member or a PDGA employee that wants to step onto our show and have any projects or conversations or initiatives, uh, plans, whatever. Uh, as always, we welcome anyone that wants to join us. And they said, yeah, let's plan it out. And probably sometime in the next few weeks, we'll have somebody from the PDGA to, you know, talk all things PDGA or, or maybe a very special or, or specific initiative, whatever the case might be. But uh, just know that that's going to happen sometime soon all right what else uh, uh yeah yeah <laughs> i was just trying to recap in my mind i i just want to again say thank you to everyone uh from las vegas and the uh I, i'll follow it up non-golf related in any capacity 
And I know you haven't been there, Johnny, but... I have not been to Vegas. Las Vegas is like a shit show right now. <laughs> be largely, almost exclusively, at least, because of the Formula One race taking place there oh, in, yes. in three weeks. It, it, I imagine just everything is getting prepped for that, and there's probably places you can't go. And just, It's insane. It, yeah. It's insane. Uh, they they tore out, if, if many of you are familiar with, the, the uh, Bellagio Fountain. First of all, it's not running, so if you're there, you're not able to see it, which is a staple in visiting Las Vegas. Currently, they don't have it running. They tore out the trees that are right there in the median on the sidewalk by the fountain because those are all... Going to be lanes? They're already oh. Uh, seats. Oh, seats. They have hmm. seating all over, and I know Brody's out on the board, but they have seating all over. There's people working 24-7 as you're walking through the strip, there's construction everywhere. Like you said, they have certain places marked off that people will and won't be able to go, obviously, at that time. But even right now, there's a ton of uh, road construction. There's all sorts of stipulations, I believe, in terms of what, like the asphalt and how it gets treated and what's available. Here's, you're, hear, you're hearing it from me now after just visiting for a weekend. I don't know how in the world that place is going to look and be completely ready in less than three weeks for what they're pulling off or trying to pull off it when if and when it gets completed and if it looks 90 percent as good as they projected i'm gonna be blown away because that place just looks like a those are a, people that know what they're doing and i get it they're working 24 hours a day they're security people just fending off other people from getting into areas it as if Vegas needed any more chaos or craziness, it just being there this weekend and seeing it, and then and then every local you speak to, every Uber driver, absolutely infuriated and pissed off and frustrated well, yeah, about what's going be. on. And then on top of it, I think there's a threat of the the culinary union, uh, maybe culinary and hospitality or something going on strike. Yeah, and that that in that in obviously includes you know restaurant but i think it includes the housekeeping yes and like fifty five thousand people i don't know uh, I, I heard something about it i didn't know when they were talking about the strike so. yeah well it's i i think the conversations are are, are happening as we speak uh, you want to talk about having some leverage yeah exactly when That's, you're you're about to host you're about to host a just giant f1 thing it really vegas has made a real effort to get into sports over the last five years with the golden knights and then bringing in uh, the, the Raiders and that F1. And UFC, obviously. UFC yep. has been has been going there for years. Yep. Boxing has been going there for years. But really to get into, to become a real sports town. Obviously, they've always had the gambling and whatnot. But it, it's it's amazing. And now they've got their crazy their crazy dome with the... Uh, <laughs> the know, sphere. The sphere. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Not the dome, the sphere. that has the, all the advertising and whatnot. It, it's, it's crazy. I can't wait to someday get out to Vegas. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it, I, and I'm, I'm you, I don't know, I don't think I'm unique in saying this, that there's, there's so many pros and cons to both the, you know, the two major focal points being the strip and Fremont. Lots of people are kind of one or the other. I love to dabble in both. I think they both have their, your, their unique perspectives and offerings when you're at them, but, uh, certainly both of them. I've said before, Vegas, what really changes in Vegas during Halloween? I don't know if it's a heck of a lot, but um, nonetheless, certainly a good time. And speaking of which, I saw him this weekend. He's a staple in the Vegas scene. Uh, he's a staple. He's just all around one of the, the nicest guys out there that we see. Kerry Trotter celebrating a birthday today Happy and birthday, also uh, playing host, playing in the event this weekend as well. But great to always see Kerry Trotter if you're at all a little bit of an old school golfer. You'll know who we're talking about. But Kerry is a staple um, there from a playing perspective. So very cool to see him out there. All right. Um, WT Force, uh, Wade's asking details on tour life. Um, yeah, uh, it's happening tomorrow night. Tomorrow at 8.30 Eastern. Well, that's when he said that I'm, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to be oh, on that, right away, but yeah, who knows? either way, uh, tomorrow night will be action will be live. All right. Um, we got snow. We talked about that here in Wisconsin. Nothing like a little snow on Halloween. It, it was funny cause they, it snowed for the morning commute 
and then stopped <laughs> yeah. and then picked back up literally for the afternoon commute. My normal 30 minute back and forth was, <laughs> was about 45. So it wasn't, mm. it wasn't too bad. I take side roads to get to downtown from where I'm at. I take the lakefront. Um, and normally it doesn't matter the type of conditions. It's almost always a straight 30 minutes, but there was some construction, which kind of threw a little wrench into it. So there was a little backup that cost me an extra 15 minutes. So. Okay. Um, is there been anything else crazy going on around uh, uh, the Packers? I saw zero minutes and zero seconds of the game, but it sounds like I didn't miss much. No, it was a. It, it, it's bad. Okay. Um, the Packers. Can we blame the quarterback or others? A little bit, but ultimately we can blame others in that the quarterback doesn't have a lot of time to throw. Mm. His wide receivers and tight ends are young. They're dropping balls. Um. There was there was like three specific passes that would have probably gone for first downs that the, the players just couldn't hold on to the ball. Literally hit him in one hit him in the hand. I think one hit him in the face mask, and the other one like he kind of had it, but then the the defender like just barely even made an effort and took it away from him. It's mm. it's a young team. The Packers are not. Um, I went into this season personally thinking if we get six to seven wins, it'll be a successful season for us. I didn't expect playoffs. I don't know if we'll even get there. They are trading. They trade away. They traded away today the, at the end of the trade deadline. Uh, Razul Douglas for a third round pick to Buffalo, who is Buffalo is a win now kind of team, which makes a lot of sense. The Packers are a win in the next two to three years kind of team. We're stocking up on draft picks and we're looking to, you know, we're, gonna, we're already, the, I think, maybe the youngest team in the league and we're only probably going to get younger. So it's going to be difficult. I don't know if uh, it's tough to say if. Jordan Love is going to be a good quarterback when, you know, his his prime running back has been injured all season in in Aaron Jones. His main wide receiver in Christian Watson hasn't been healthy all season. He's playing with the half a deck of cards. It's just it's really it's really tough to evaluate a guy on on you know he's he's not Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers could still <laughs> could take this team and still get to probably nine wins without without a problem. He's not Aaron Rodgers. Okay, we'll see. I mean, uh, I, I got to give the guy at least, you know, two to three years and hopefully at least try to get something behind him. But, uh, Johnny, have you seen Victor Wambenya? Wambenya? I don't know how to pronounce that. I know who you're talking about from the Spurs yet. Uh, I keep asking. I'll keep asking until you say you've seen him. I have seen him. He's a giant. I saw him before, even before the draft because there was a lot of talk about him. I'm not some any, any sort of crazy scout or anything. I don't pay much attention to to the NBA other than the Bucks, but I have seen him. He he is a a a giant beast of a man, and not even I mean beast as in just height. And he's young. He'll probably still fill out. He's going to be very scary when he fills out in five years, like like Giannis. Giannis was a beanpole coming into the league, and now he's <laughs> he's a very manly man. That that Giannis. So. He is, uh, he's going to be something special, it seems like. So, yeah, he's from France. He is, is he seven, seven one, something like that, I think in height. Just, he he, he looks like a, in all tense of verses, he looks like a freak. Just so long. He's got like a, I think they said an eight foot wingspan. <laughs> and that he can he can easily guard, you know, 10 feet. When he puts his hands out and just That's they showed insane. someone shooting a three and him jumping up and he got the he was like six feet away from the dude and still blocking it. It <laughs> he is he's 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 a he's a broken human he's a broken individual. Um, I pronounced Wem Wem Ben Yama Wem Ben Yama. Thank you. I'll have a problem with that. Um, but uh, yeah, he's he's crazy. I I look forward to seeing him play at some point. Mm. Uh, maybe if he comes to, uh, comes to Milwaukee, we'll get a chance to see him play for the. Wait a minute! How does our Australian uh, counterpart uh, Kinga know how to pronounce that? Way to be on it, Kinga. We love you. Uh, real quick, I wanted to talk about uh, for just go for a sec in that the NADGT championships taking place this weekend. We talked about that. A uh, I know we did, but uh, a few numbers to add to it. 
996 competitors in total down there this weekend. And I saw a post from Patrick Brown today, and obvious, and I think Ricky Wysocki. Clearly, there's a, a lot of representation there from our, you know, our top pros sort and other companies. MA1 by rating. I did. Oh, who's the top? Elijah rated? Cleary rated. 998, I, I think maybe the more interesting number to me is the 100, 189,237 as a PDJ number, which is uh, mind-numbing to well, me. Well, I just think that we in the past, we've seen some really good competitors come out of NADG, NADGT. NADGT, yeah. Yep, yep. Um, Kyle Klein, yep, yep. Silas yep. Schultz, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Mike Groth, right? Yep, yep, and... Like, and yeah, a lot of those guys. Yeah, like all of which are names. I mean, Mike Groth is probably the least known name on the tour right now. Um, he, he he's playing, but he's he's not really in contention yeah. at this point. Chris, Chris yep. Kesselhoff, yeah. Chris Kesselhoff, yeah. Yep. Yep. Younger kids, but those are guys that you know. If if you want to see what the future of our sport looks like, you know, watch Certainly. watch this weekend. Watch yeah. watch these guys because you're, you're you're going to be seeing them pop up on the tour. Yeah, and uh, yeah, 998 top rated competitor, uh, Lucas Carmichael, 994, uh, Corbin Milcheski, 992, and Caleb Nash at 983. Caleb Nash with a PDGA number of 42679. So that's got to be one of the lower PDGA numbers. Yeah. Uh, yes, he has the lowest PDGA number. Do you know who uh, that is? I feel like I've met Caleb. Uh, is he a younger guy that like got signed up by his parents? Is he? Mm, he's or is he play, older? He's, he's got uh, PDG numbers since 2017, and if you click on that, maybe we'll see when he first came into the PDG. Yeah, he but, was playing junior one boy, so he was under 19 okay. in 2017. So uh, yeah, the math would uh, tell you that. that. Sounds about right. Then. Yeah. So. Anyway, uh, seeing that is pretty incredible to see 212 of those competitors. And then when you're looking at FA1, the other highest uh, division, so to speak, there, uh, Allison, whoop, I apologize. Let me sort by rating. Yeah, Allison Latch uh, rated 875. Rebecca Minnick rated 871. Kai Klein at 866. And uh, Ashton Weberly. Uh, listed at also at 866. So those are your top four competitors, and I won't go through all the divisions. But, uh, yeah, so those are, you, you know, clearly you got to be thinking, like you just said, you look at an AM Worlds, you look at a, an AM Nationals, those are often, you know, winners there and top performers there are clearly right on the cusp of becoming your, well, next generation or your next amateur title. Uh, you know, champions are also the, you know, in the training grounds for the, elite level professional side. So good luck to all of them. Um, good luck to everyone. Part of running the event, uh, a, a 996 person event uh, oh, in, in that of itself is, is borderline insane. So to the Kyles and Dave and everyone else involved and everyone in Texas, good luck. <laughs> that's, that's what I'll say there. Sounds like a, uh, a pretty insane undertaking uh, for sure. Non disc golf question for you, Terry. Uh oh. Have you played with or used Chat yes. GPT at all? I I don't want to say surprisingly, but I almost surprisingly have not essentially touched it. Which feels like I should and and I feel I mean, if you don't have use for it. That's... No, I I feel like there could be uses for it, but one of the things that I noticed just today, I was driving with my daughter in the car and I had a question maybe you can answer this but I had a question for Google and then where where eventually are we going to cross the line between Google and ChatGBT kind of spitting out the same stuff and I what I say is I, f I forget what it was but it, oh I know what it was I said uh hey hey Google when is the championship volleyball match for WIAA girls volleyball this weekend. That was the question I asked Google. Okay. And it spit up the WIAA website and it actually brought me to their bracket. Pretty damn close to what I was asking for. Like where is that line between what Google can answer and then what chat if if I would have had chat B, G, chat GPT open, 
would it have given me? Not with what you have for ChatGPT, because the ChatGPT, unless you pay for it, is limited to, I believe, data from two years ago. They, just training data. Now, they do have uh, their new version that if you pay for it, ChatGPT and ChatGPT4, um, that you can point to the internet. And there are even plugins that will just go out and search as well. But, okay. But right now, for you and me, because I don't pay for it, um, you, that is not a question in general you want. You probably would want to ask ChatGPT. That's much more of a Google question, certainly. So but, when will Google that? So that still the, the, my, that still I, poses I, the question: like, when is when is Google going to be so smart that it can? Oh, Google! I mean, you mean when is ChatGPT going to be so smart? Or when no, is, or Google? Like, I I want it was well, just I, mean, Google, I say that because it was something that was so timely and specific, mm -hmm. and I keep thinking. Why are, are we there? Are we almost there? We're almost there. Why aren't we there yet? Like, what what else is it going to take? Because I, I want to just be able to s just literally ask anything. Yeah, in the next couple of years, I think most of you, most of it, like the voice assistants will all be run through these LL, uh, these these large language models and just be able to answer anything for you and just at least give you an approximation. I, whether you can trust the data, that's a whole other thing. Especially if they're just telling you as opposed to like bringing up a website like you were looking for. Because if, if Google had, if you asked Google Voice Assistant and told you, oh, it's April 3rd, 2023 or something, you're, you're probably just going to assume that's right, but you don't know for sure. At least with a website, you can look and, and verify like, oh yeah, there's a real website here. It brought me the WIA website. I, I get it. I, mean, I think we're a ways away from the uh, the chat modules being up to date. I know there's there are voice plugins for ChatGPT for the paid people and this and that, that it will talk to you just like Siri. Yeah, I, maybe I just need to pay for it then because maybe that I, I've will I've thought about paying the more. $10 a month for it, but... It's $10 a month, it's $10 huh? a month, yeah. Hmm. Is Space Force in charge of that? They're not. All right, I just got to think about who's behind it. I trust it. And I was asking because, in general, I use it all the time. Like, I use it for work, my 9 to 5. I have it... A lot of times if I want to... Hey, Jap GPT, how do I make it look like I'm busy today? <laughs> You're not too far off, Terry. No, um, in, in general, I use it to like write a lot of scripts for me mm -hmm. because I, I'm too lazy to like write a, a PowerShell script. Like, I want to take a script that, hey, guess what? I want, I want to add a new user to my Active Directory. I want to add it to email. I want to add it to this. I want to make sure they get this. I could sit and spend an hour and a half to write a script, or I could just say, hey... Do this for me and just be a little bit more verbose, maybe two to three sentences, and it will spit out 95% of what I need. Like, oh, I need to change this and alter this. The Over the last week and a half, I have used it for like things that I've, I've never even thought about, like programming. That like, was going to be my next like question that, like is, that is how long before you're, I'm just asking a program to write everything I want. Uh, pretty, like, pretty close, Sweet. honestly. Like I, I'm not a programming whiz. I don't know if no, you know this. I'm not either. <laughs> I, I'm I'm I know Windows and I know networking. I, I'm I know the basics of programming. I've I watched a couple uh over the last couple months ago. I watched this thing on how to program uh, in Laravel, which is what Skipbase is programming. Yeah, okay. and that I don't know because I've handed it off. I don't understand a lot of what it, what it does and how it does it, but I want to be able to update it. So I watched that. And I have this new idea that I want to start kind of trying to work on, maybe a new format. But the guys that I have, the guys that I'm paying over the off season already have a job. You know, they're working on a specific set of goals for Skip Base. I kind of want to do something maybe a little different. I'm like 80% of the way to what I want as mm. far as like the programming language. So I will just literally tell it, hey, Laravel, or, or hey, ChatGPT, Write me a Laravel page that does this, this, and this. And I'm like, okay. And it gives me step by step, and here's how we do it. And then it, it'll give you things like, this is where you put the logic. I'm like, okay, cool. Put the logic in there for me, and I want it to do this. And I'm like, okay, this is a good example of how you want. And it just, it takes seconds. And it's literally just a matter of ask, repeatedly asking it questions. I, I am amazed at what it can do. And I know Tim has worked with a little bit with the art stuff, which I haven't touched, mm -hmm. but just in general, it is, it's going to, it's, it's going to break people. Yeah. Like, it's well, like lawyers. I think in general, I, I 
think a lot of maybe doctors, as far as my understanding is a lot of people now that have access to the version four are just, are able to put in all this information and get relatively good diagnosis where they can just go to their doctor and be like, Hey, is this what's wrong with me? And people are like, Oh yeah, you're right. That's what mm. this is. Um, a lot of people I think are worried that chat GPT or automation is going to eliminate a lot of low paying jobs. And I don't think that's the case. I think we're going to start seeing things like accountants and lawyers and I don't want to say doctors. Cause obviously you still need surgeons and things yeah. like that you can't, can't get rid of that. But I think you're more than likely going to see a lot of that middle management type, that middling uh, data data input go away in, in the next ten years or so. And not that I'm saying we're going to. I'm, I'm worried about economy because I think this is going to end up making jobs just like every new technology exactly. practically does. But it's. I was just thinking that today as I was working on it because I don't know anything. So I've got this back end of the program that's mostly done. Now I need to work on the front end of the program, which is design and things like that. But even that, I don't know how to make that interact with the back end. So I'm just, I just ask it questions. Hey, how do I get Flutter to do this? Oh, try this. Oh yeah. That looks like exactly what I want to do. <laughs> and I just copy and paste it in there. No. It's, it is really scary and crazy. And that's only the free version that I have. That's why I'm so tempted. I'm like, I want to pay for the full version and see all the extra cool crap that I can get. I want to plug it into the internet. And really kind of go from there. So. Yeah, I, I will follow it up there. When I open, I want to say, I don't know if it was Photoshop or Illustrator the other day in Adobe, I opened it up and it said something about, here's our new, uh, create our, our new creative AI or gener generative AI. And it, I, I think I typed in, uh, <laughs> I think I typed in bear and Frisbee maybe, uh, to see what it spit out. And it was kind of interesting, and it gave you a couple different versions. And like you said, you could continue to uh, refine. refine it if you wanted. Um, and I, I thought it was kind of funny what it was, just from an artistic <laughs> perspective, what it was spitting out. I'm like, well, I, and I, I guess used, I have my new logo coming. <laughs> I used the old uh, Mid Journey, which uh, is just another image creation thing. And this was uh, maybe a year ago, and it couldn't do disc golf. Like, it just doesn't understand... Like I, yeah. I, I was saying something like, Hey, give me a disc golf basket in the woods. Wow. It yeah. doesn't understand what a disc golf basket is. No. And it would just give you the weirdest, like deformed cage kind of, mm -hmm. and then you try to explain like, no, it's more like a, like a metal basket with, <laughs> with chains hanging down and, a, and, a, and do like a, a, a like a, a metal basket with a pole in the center. And it just, it, it's hard to describe a disc golf basket without, yeah w without actually showing a picture. It's kind of, it it couldn't it couldn't do anything. So uh, Tim is saying both Illustrator and Photoshop have. Okay, so AI. yeah, it was one of the two that I logged into this weekend. Yeah, I I've, I haven't messed with the Photoshop one, but yeah, but it's 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 scary. And I, I keep thinking like, how is this going to at all, if anything, change disc golf or sports? And I don't know, I don't know if it will. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if you're going to be able to at some point just you know if we're going to be able to say, hey, b build me an app like UDisk. And yeah. it'll be able to go through and be like, oh, sure, I can, here's, here's you know, 90 or 80% of what UDISC does or anything like that. I, I don't know. I mean, granted, UDISC does some phenomenal stuff, and I'm sure they're using AI for their programming as well. But it's, uh, we're, we're, we're in for some crazy changes, Terry. Yeah, and earlier I know I was just talking about, uh, sorry to backtrack, but I, want, I do want to mention the NADGT going on in Austin this weekend. If you look on uh, DGPT and their news section, it says the FA1 lead card is teeing off at 9.05 a.m. Central, and the MA1 lead card will be teeing off at 2.05 Central. So that's what you'll be able to see this weekend, and I just wanted to uh, button that all up and be able to, to share that with you. Let me put that in for anyone that really cares. It's also now a link in the chat at the moment. So yeah, um, it, it, yeah, <laughs> it will be interesting to see. And, and Dondo on the board is saying, uh, basically everybody should be, uh, finding a way to get caught up or on board, or you're going to be left behind. And th th of course that's going to be, I, I think it's going it, to, you, if you are, more in tune and up to speed, clearly you're going to have a distinct advantage in jumping on things way before everyone else. Uh, basically adopting, uh, I agree with you, if you're adopting something like that early, because it's not, 
it's it's not, not going away, away. <laughs> it's no. not it's not going to well, lessen and, and just last week i had to write a new policy for our office for something to do with email and security and i was just like ugh i, I don't want to write this policy and then i thought huh let me go to chat gpt and i just put it like write a policy for email security and then one other thing it gave me like a, an 8 point full page and i was like that's really good. Chat GPT, write me and out I, of my own position and, at my job. And I just copy, I copy and pasted it. I literally altered probably a dozen words just to make it fit a little bit more with our industry. And I gave it to our lawyer and said, there, that's pretty much what I want. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, cool. That's great. Good job, John. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Yeah, you're so smart. Mm. Right? No. That's not what you're saying? All right. Seth Muncy was also out on the board a little while ago. Seth, thank you again for joining us. We appreciate you uh, you hopping on. Carney said, is the PDGA 100% AI articles in art now? I, I do not believe that PDGA is the magazine, case. PDGA Magazine, 100%. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, Ray says, I think one of Tyler Brickley's last disc golf comedy joke was making the chat GP DGPT thing for Smashbox. Yes, he did do that. That silly goose. Uh, what should I throw on hole six is what... Tim wants to ask. Uh, yeah, maybe at some point it'll be smart enough to, uh, you know, break down distances probably. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, if, if you if you asked it like, hey, I've got about a five mile hour headwind, um, <laughs> it, it, it maybe at that point knows in general your discs in your bag because you've put it in there. Yeah. And at some point, maybe you've even submitted video to it so it gets a general profile of you and it's like, <laughs> oh, odds are you you probably <laughs> Don't want... throw a forehand, you idiot. You suck at those. <laughs> yeah. What are you thinking? You you, you want you want to throw your, your, your beat destroyer here and don't throw it poorly, dumbass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't blame me when you miss. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think, I, I don't know how much it was new, so to speak. It wasn't really news news as much as the, uh, I think the PDGA just in the last day or two, at least on the socials, put out their, the, all of the a nice calendar representation, not calendar, uh, geographic representation of the majors. I think that was also released on the PDGA, uh, you know, socials here recently. They did. Um, that was something else that I saw. Oh, okay. So now multiple people. I'm looking at someone I, who went with the eagle slash disc. Well, I mean, it's, we, it's not really particular to eagle. No, we've seen that in the past. Like yeah. that is not an uncommon uh, costume. costume to yeah, have, no. To I have the discs. I I will hand. release one tomorrow. There was a gentleman, and I apologize. I don't know his name. Hopefully, I can learn it. Um, in Vegas, uh, specifically, had a a very eagle themed costume and uh maybe i'll pull that from the footage and release that as a separate clip tomorrow but uh i, I did see some of that in vegas also i thought it was of note just yesterday uh that over at a b tier because we're usually talking about b tiers in the ma40 division dga presents the odyssey challenge at de la viega did you see this no oh no i did see this yeah. PDGA released this yeah a 13 person well the the first 13 people that had that are in this division were all separated by a single stroke uh and from you, one spot to the next yeah so it went in even perfect plus one, order plus two plus three plus four plus five so all the way up to plus 13 <laughs> plus 12 yep or a plus 12 i'm sorry that like, <laughs> nobody was there were no ties from from first through 13th and they were all one stroke apart it, it, truly incredible wow. like <laughs> and and their post was you know when you see it and I, I, for whatever reason i like I it took it. me one second yeah. i was like holy cow like every person mm -hmm. is separated by a single stroke all the way down to 13th it was pretty cool uh weekly plug cold turkey is now probably close to two-thirds if not three-quarters of the way full uh that's the c tier that i host right after thanksgiving 72 spots on Saturday, uh, 72 spots on Sunday for all the other divisions. And then if you can't or don't want to play two rounds in either of those single days, you could play in the flex start that's exclusively offered on Saturday, where it's just two rounds of nine on the very short and very easy uh, Red Fox course. So you normally play Gray Fox, classic pins, two rounds of 18. That's for the regular event. If you don't want to play in those Saturday or Sunday or you get shut out or, or whatever, don't have the time, then you could be playing in uh, the 
flex start. So just wanted to throw that out there. And real quick, 50, so only 19 spots available for Sunday remain. And on Saturday, I think it's even less than that. There are uh, 14 spots available. Okay. So get signed up if you want to come play in a tournament that I'm offering at the end of the month. Let's give something away, Terry Miller. Yes, let's give it away. Give it away, give it away, give it away now. Yes, a little blood sugar sex magic. Yes. Uh, Patreon.com slash Smashbox TV. You can be eligible for our weekly giveaway. Uh, we have 135 people eligible for our giveaway this week. Again, you, all you have to do is give as little as a dollar a month. I just ordered another... Um, Mini, Dimax Mini, so I'm going to have to update our picture. Nice. So thank you to our $5 patron for doing that. He signed up earlier this year, and it finally finally got around to doing it. Um, I, I was literally waiting for somebody else to do it, and then uh, they lowered their tier, so then they weren't a $5 patron before. Like it, it was just a big mess, and so I ended up putting it off, and then I just put it off even longer. So completely my Sir. fault. But, but yes, so patreon.com slash smashboxTV, sign up, and you can be eligible or you can go to smashbox.tv slash weekly giveaways every week and have to sign up for that. Like a, uh, web. Yeah, you can do that. That's, that's, All right. That's the lame way to do it. Let's do it. Uh, this weekend, my big win on the horses while playing Sigma Derby mm -hmm. was on the horse, uh, the one, three combo. There's five horses. You select a button, which two will finish in the top two spots. And I always go for the biggest odds. You're, you're betting a quarter. So I always go for the biggest odds and my, the biggest odds that hit for me at any point in playing that game were on the one, three horses. So naturally we have to go with two as our number. We're going to split, split the, difference. the difference. All right, Terry, two is our number. They are two sorted is the by number. first name. Sigma Derby at the D. Uh, our this first is not number a paid is 48. Our second number is 79. So 79. 79. 79. I just have to scroll up a little bit. Again, sort it. Oh, no, I didn't sort it by first name. I'm sorry. It is not sorted. Um, oh, it's, it's, so it's, it's just all gonna, out of sorts. It's all out you of would sorts. Say. <laughs> yeah. hey -oh. So 79 is Kurt Bimler. Congratulations, Kurt, Kurt Bimler. I Love it. I think, I've heard, I think we've mentioned his name before, but it's, it's been a it's, long it's been, time. It's been a while. I do recognize the address, though. <laughs> That's so, creepy. I do. No, <laughs> that is creepy, Terry. Kurt, Miller. I'm outside your house. <laughs> <laughs> Look out your window. I'll give you a disc. <laughs> Trick or treat. You say Kurt. I say Kurt and Rods. I'm right outside your no. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, Kurt. It's been a while, but I do uh, recognize this, this city and state. So, um, yeah. Sweet. Kurt, coming your way. I like it. Uh, I have a uh, very, yeah, I've, I've got a special disc to send your way, and I'm happy to do oh, that's so. That's awesome. Congratulations, Kurt. Thanks for being a Patreon supporter for quite a long time, actually. Oh, speaking of supporters, this weekend, a big supporter, a big supporter uh, rolled out of the Facebooks. One of my favorites out of Madison, Ron Witt, a real brainiac. <laughs> is this just the time when Terry just takes the dunks on people? Uh, I might. Uh, no, it, the only reason uh, how this further came about is the Pro Tour took it upon themselves to post a little uh, throwback clip of me. Did you see oh, that? I did see that from, uh, from, is that from, from Disc TV? From, yeah, from Disc TV, from Back Sandy Point. 2002? Uh, 2002, Ooh. to which is always funny, and, I, and I'm, uh, clearly I'm not offended by it, but it's always funny when people are like, what? He played, he played or plays disc golf? Yes, I, I do or have. Uh, some decades were much better than others. But yes, the... So 20, 2002, which would have made me, uh, what, like 24? Holy cow. I guess that was, that was a little while ago, but, uh, <laughs> or so. Yeah. Um, but yes, there was a clip of me making a putt as they were, uh, cutting from one segment into another. Uh, I believe that actual full episode, uh, covered USDGC and probably at some point covered the Sandy Point team invitational. And so there was a B roll clip of me making, uh, probably a circle's edge putt. Sure. And uh, a lot of the comments within there, I, I was amused by, by people, some people who do know me or know my, you know, knew my game, had very polite things to say. Ron Witt, uh, a complete, 
just d bag of the largest proportions decided to chime in and uh didn't go well for him and then um which is fine he went on to say some mean nasty uh things and then uh i i made a post that kind of rebutted uh him apologizing to me a couple years ago for being a dickhead he said i just wanted to say hey i'm a, I'm a super big d-bag and i apologize for being that to you all these years i was wrong and then he came out and then three years later he comes back maybe he forgot he apologized <laughs> well i posted i posted the <laughs> apology for all to see he, he forgot that i saved my receipts as the kids right. would say yeah you do um and it was it was kind of a funny interaction but i do appreciate all the kind words and the funny things people posted when they see that i was playing disc golf back in well in any year let alone 2002 well, at 2002 you were already a veteran <laughs> Yeah, uh, I was I was six. Yeah, six, seven. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I was gonna say that was that was already my seventh worlds by that time. And yeah, yeah I'd been playing for uh, eight or nine years. So mm. anyway, uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty funny to see. Uh oh, Josh McDaniel just got fired. I don't he know who did that from is. The Raiders. He's the head coach from the Raiders. <laughs> Brody's wife is now the coach. Yeah. That, well, I mean, that, she would do probably just as good of a job as Josh <laughs> McDaniels was doing. I take it he's not good. The Raiders are a mess like the Packers. The difference okay. between the Raiders and the Packers, the the we, Packers are a young team that, and we have cheerleaders from the local high school. We do. No, local college. Oh yeah, Saint that, Norbert. That sounds right. It's, yeah. from, it's from Saint Thank Norbert. Thank God. Yeah, local high school. <laughs> That'd be. I, I know it's a little up north, but a little creepy. <laughs> Um, and the Raiders were much, are a much more established team. They were kind of hoping that, you know, with a, they have a really good running back. They had, you know, uh, Devonta Adams went there. They pulled in, um, Jimmy G as their quarterback from the 49ers. They had kind of like an established team that they were thinking was a playoff contender and they've just sucked, mm. just sucked. And granted, Jimmy G got hurt a little bit, but he's coming back. They've just been a bad team, so it's like different expectations when you're when you're a when you expect to be a decent team and you turn out you suck versus the Packers, which everyone knew kind of was this year was more of a building year, um, and you suck. Yeah, that's uh, that that's a problem, and I think it's the second time now Josh Josh uh, Josh McDaniel was fired from a team. I think he got fired from Broncos a couple years ago, mm. and then he went he went back to the Patriots. So that's that, not good. It's not working out well for him. Okay. Um, I'll uh, try not to. Yeah. All right. Do we have anything else we need to cover? Let me check the boards. Uh, Pete Uliberry, real quick, uh, put out some coverage. Uh, I did not get a chance to watch it, but I know that he actually, like, I think filmed, probably commentated, and did some other things, some uh, of his own coverage on a card. Fantastic. Uh, which is pretty cool. So, uh, big shout out to Pete. Uh, many of you have referenced how much you enjoy pete on commentary he's done so with me very graciously and uh so pretty cool this and he's also a phenomenal drone flyer so it's pretty cool to see that now he's uh taken another step and putting in some uh shot by shot coverage of his own oh crosby is a beast defensive end crosby stills and nash and young yeah or something like that. All right, I think we can call it. Uh, we appreciate all of you guys for joining us tonight. We, of course, appreciate our headliner, our special guest in Disc Golf Strong and the Pro Tour Zone, Seth Muncy. So thank you so much for joining us, Seth. I uh, hope you guys had a good Halloween. Happy birthday, Merry Christmas, and uh, happy anniversary to all those out there celebrating. For Johnny V, I'm the Disc Golf Guy. That's 478's after show. We'll see you next week with some big news. We'll see you then when you step inside the Smashbox.